Friday night. Happy Cocktail Night. Happy Canada Day, everybody. I'm sorry about that delay. I am in Jocelyn's battle room. Oh, it is hot tonight. Happy July. Happy July 1st. And for those of you who are joining us and don't know what the show is about, we are celebrating Canada Day today. This is exciting. We have a lot of Canadian friends who I know are logged on today um, and put together a wonderful episode that obviously revolves around amazing rug picking artists from Canada through the years. That is our theme for tonight. Happy cocktail night. It is great to see you. It seems so weird that it's Friday. It doesn't seem like a normal day to me, I'll tell you. Um, it doesn't help that I was just unconscious for a good long time. I lay down to take a rest. Um, and it is so hot. I fell asleep for like an hour, which is like rumpled skin for me. So, uh, Anita, happy Canada Day. Great to see you. I am so ashamed tonight. I am celebrating with um, Poland spring water. I'm just not feeling super great. This heat is getting to me. Happy Canada Day. London, Ontario, it's hot, but you had a nice bit of rain. Well, that clears things right up. Oh, but the rain on Canada Day, that's not so good, is it? I, I know that there's a lot. I was, I was looking up things that were happening on Canada Day, and um, and I realized there's lots of celebrations and events and things like that. It's like a federal holiday um, and a big deal. You know, I looked and saw, in case I didn't know exactly what Canada Day was, was about and what it celebrated other than, obviously, Canada. Uh, so I looked it up and I found this out. I don't, I can't believe I didn't know this already, but I read on Wikipedia that Canada Day, that was formerly known as Dominion Day, and that name only changed in 1982, which was not that long ago. Um, so many people must remember saying Dominion Day, and it might maybe even it's uh, it's so confusing that one time of year to say Happy Canada Day. Is it the kind of a thing where you would see somebody? I'm asking this to my Canadian friends. Is it the kind of a thing where if you saw someone on the street or if you saw somebody yesterday, you would say something like, have a wonderful Canada Day? Is it that kind of thing? Um, just wondering. So it says, uh, formerly known as Dominion Day, it celebrates the anniversary of, of Canadian uh, Confederation, Confederation, which occurred July 1st, 1867, with the passing of the British North American Act, where the three separate colonies um, of the United Canadas, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick were united into a single dominion within the British Empire called Canada. Uh, and again, that changed in 1982 to be called Canada Day rather than Dominion Day. I think that does, it sounds a bit more catchy, doesn't it? But interesting. Happy Canada Day. What a time to celebrate. I, I hope that you saw, if you were in our Facebook group, which is Rug Picking Inc., that's beautiful. This morning I put out a, an antique rug pattern that has been in the set um, of... Uh, I believe it's a beaver, um, called Frank Lloyd Beaver, I think. Um, but it's a, I thought it was appropriate for Canada Day. So that has been available today uh, and will be available, I say, for the next few days through the long weekend for us um, to celebrate. So that is both in the Facebook group. If you are not on Facebook, it's also a free PDF in the Rib and Candy Hooking store. So ribandcandyhooking.com. And if you Google Frank Lloyd or maybe Franklin Lloyd Beaver, but certainly the word Beaver will take you right to this. And the, if you drop into the drop down box, it's available on linen, lunchcloth, whatever. But the drop down box also has PDF. So PDF is free. And then it just automatically gets sent to you and you blow it up to whatever size you want, print it however you want, and it's your pattern to use. So hopefully that'll be fun for some people. Carol, it's great to see you. Sunny in 70s in Wisconsin. That sounds ideal. Gayla, happy Canada Day. Gamer says, happy Canada Day. I love it. I just love it. Kaz, thank you again for the lovely surprise box you sent. Happy Canada Day. Kirsten says, happy Canada Day. There's going to be a lot of happy. Those of you in Canada, this is your day. We, we are celebrating not just the rug pickers of your, and contemporary rug pickers in this episode, but we are celebrating you. This is a special day for you. So uh, you are the toast of the night. Poland Springs, but nonetheless, Cheers, my dears. Happy Canada Day. Happy Canada Day to you. I hope that you had a wonderful day and that you're still celebrating. Mm. That hot. Linda, good to see you. And Karen, Robin, great to see you. Cheers to Canada. Cheers to that. Absolutely. Christy, great to see you. Mom, great to see you. We had a wonderful sushi lunch today with my sister uh, celebrating her birthday. Well, it wasn't today on Canada Day. It was earlier in the week. Julia, you know, I was just looking at the post that you put up uh, in the 
or TV and computer film, and that post has gotten a crazy amount of views and comments. Like it's it's like two thousand or something. People loving it and going to it, and it stays way at the top of the thread because it's so popular. Uh, it is a beautiful piece that you're working on. It is just gorgeous. Oh, you finished the Chesapeake Fantasy one, did you? You were very close during the week, so I'm not surprised. Oh, I can't wait to see it. It is a glorious show. Joy, happy Canada Day from Joy and Courtney. Are you together? Are you in Florida again? Ooh. Cheryl, great to see you. Happy Friday. And Colleen, happy Friday. Dave, Colleen and Dave, happy Canada Day. I know you're both up there celebrating. Pizza and cider tonight. Fantastic. Lynn, you're not... Can you hear me now? Wow. Okay. Can you hear me at all? I'm going to wait for the delay. I'm going to I'm just going to do it. Can you hear me now? I can't believe I did that again. Uh huh. Found it now. Okay. Here we are. You heard me. <laughs> is it better now? I got full volume going here. Oh, wait a minute. How's that? Can you hear me now? Some hear a bit, very softly. I'm putting it all the way up. But no sound, a lot less fuzzy. That was the camera. Uh, can barely hear you. Okay, I'm not sure what to do. I've got everything on full. No change. Okay. Yes, that's better. It's getting better. Okay, that looks like a lot of betters. Okay. So I'm going to do it one more time. Can you hear me now? I think you probably can. I'm getting a lot better. Oh, dear. I am so sorry about that. I said I would never do that again. I would start at the bottom. Okay. I have it on full volume. Hopefully I'm not too loud now. I do not know why that happened. Um, I am so sorry about that. I'm looking at the program that I use and I, I don't think to check this because I run so many live shows. The, the, where the volume was supposed to be on the level was all the way back at like zero and I haven't changed it certainly. So just, mm, Denise, good to see you. Joy, I'm very happy that you and Courtney are together. That is wonderful. Well, I am so sorry about that. Um, I hate it when my mouth runs and it's useless. Wendy, I saw you. Great to see you. Sue's great to see you. And Teresa, thank you. I am so glad. It, I would have been very disappointed to not run the Canada Day episode on Canada. Aileen, happy Canada Day. Good to see you. Okay, good. Well, that makes me feel better. I was whew, starting to feel a bit sick. Okay, happy Canada Day. Great to see you. Good episode tonight couple of things I want to tell you now that I know that we are working okay. Full volume is great. Okay, good. Goodness gracious. That's not what I really want to say. You know that. But I'm not going to say what I really want to say. That's super frustrating, isn't it? That's putting it mildly. Um, am I going to repeat everything? <laughs> you know, I'll repeat briefly what I said because I, I started the show by saying I had to look up what Canada Day was. And I'm sorry if this is like Groundhog Day, if you could hear me faintly. Um, I had to look it up because I'm an, I'm an ignorant American and I did not know. And I was fairly ashamed that I didn't know because so many of this audience and customers and friends are Canadian. And indeed, I am almost all French Canadian, right? Because, Mom, you are in large part French Canadian. Dad was all French Canadian. Um, so I ought to know. I had to look it up on Wikipedia. Good, Anita. Um, and, I, and I found out what Canadians already know, that Canada Day celebrates the anniversary of the Canadian Confederation, um, which happened in, on January, sorry, July 1st, 1867. And that is when the three parts of Canada, then the United Canada's, the Nova, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick were all united into one single dominion. And apparently it was called Dominion Day uh, for all the years until 1982 when it was switched to Canada Day. I found that surprising too because I was remarking so quietly, just kidding, I'm just kidding, 
I was remarking that uh, for many people, 1982 was not that long ago. I wonder if it's hard that one time a year to say, Happy Canada Day. I wonder if occasionally people slip and say, Happy Dominion Day. But I thought it was interesting. It is the day of the Confederation Act. Yep, that is, that's so interesting. Eugenia, great to see you. Okay, great. I'm going to move forward now that I know everything's okay because it is a great episode tonight. I want to tell you one other, two other things uh, right as we get started. Thank you. A huge thank you to Kirsten, who I always have a huge thank you for because she helps me infinitely and endlessly with the Facebook page, our site, the Rug Cooking and Punch Needle Club. I was also reminding you so quietly earlier that there is the free pattern up for Canada Day. It'll go up right through the long weekend for us here, too. Um, of, um, Fra I think it's called Franklin Lloyd Beaver, right? So the Beaver for Canada. Uh, and that is both in the Facebook group. And if you are not on Facebook, you can go to ribboncandyhooking.com. Just put search word Beaver. That's the only pattern I have, incredibly, right, with the word Beaver in it. Um, and it'll pull it up and just go down the drop down box. And, you know, obviously don't choose it on linen or monk's cloth because then you're, then you're choosing a physical item. Um, but choose it as a PDF and it immediately gets sent to you so you can transfer it and use it. Make it any size you want. It is a beautiful adapted antique rug pattern that I had that I thought would be perfect for Dominion Day, Canada Day. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And a huge thank you to Kirsten because we are bringing back this week after at least a year, if not two, probably a year and a half, our weekly uh, hook, virtual hook-in. So Ribbon Candy Virtual Hookin', hook we used to, before I got very, very busy with the first book, we used to log on once a week for a couple of hours and chat and hook while we were all up on the screen with each other over Zoom um, and chat with each other and new people logged on to get questions and it was extremely informal, a lot of fun. People came and go as they could, left their screen for a long time or just logged on for a few minutes to ask a question or stayed for a couple hours hooking. Uh, chatting, telling stories, very informal. It is not a lesson. It is not a demo. It's just for fun. So that starts up again this coming Tuesday the 5th from 11 to 1. Now Kirsten is going to be the host of these weekly Tuesdays. I have, I am positive that I will be logging on 99% of the time on Tuesdays, but Kirsten will be the host in the, on the off chance that I get consumed with something or I have some kind of a crazy deadline and I can't be on. I will be on 99% of the time to chat and also hook because that's my going to be my chance to get some stuff done too. So starting this coming Tuesday the 5th, every Tuesday between 11 and 1 Eastern Standard Time, um, the Zoom information, I will put it into this video. I just We just confirmed it like one minute before the show. It's already in the Facebook group. Um, and if you are looking for it and you can't find it, just write me at ribbancandyhooking at gmail.com. I'll put it into a blog on ribbancandyhooking.com too, so you can log on and Zoom with us. Uh, and that should be a lot of fun. It's great to be able to get Canada as 155 years old today. That is, that is so romantic and nice. I love the thought of that. Um, oh, Anita said, my mom and dad married this day back in 1949. Oh, how beautiful is that? What a perfect day to celebrate, right? More than one thing. So I will remind you all that those Zooms are coming back. Um, and like I said, I'm going to be on the call and you can definitely chat with me and ask questions if you want to talk to me directly. But Kirsten is going to be the sort of moderator and host of it. She's such a smart, gentle, easygoing, fun person. She's the perfect person to run these. And I'm going to just hang out and hook with you. So coming up this Tuesday. Also, I've had a lot of questions in the last week about Monet. The Monet class is... Um, I'm not going to say it's filling up because it's a Zoom class, but there's a lot of people signed up for Monet, which is fantastic, designing like Monet. But I've had two very specific questions. Am I still putting out Monet patterns? Yes, I am in the next two days. That is on my list for this week, and I just got consumed with some other things. Always happens. But yes, Monet, actual Monet patterns, because he's in the public domain, will be out in the Ribbon Candy uh, Hooking Store this week. The second question was, uh, are you doing, are you dyeing wool and yarn in Monet's colors? And absolutely yes, right? That is th literally the next thing on my checklist of things to do. Monet is the next thing. So in the next 48 hours, because this is a holiday weekend for us too, coming up to the 4th in the United States, um, 4th of July, um, I'll be working on those things. And I'm also going to be putting together, because another question keeps coming up, am I going to do a class hooking with yarn? 
Um, yes, I am going to do a hooking with yarn class, and it's going to be a Monet pattern, a very simple Monet pattern. So I'm putting those things kind of together. Yes to Monet wools, yes to Monet yarns, and also yes to beginner class hooking with wool. And it will be, again, a simple Monet, maybe the water lilies. I'm looking at a couple of outdoor scenes that are exceptionally pretty and simple that we can do with color changing yarn. So those things are all coming up. Look for those over the holiday weekend because you will see them pop up. But for now, it is time to celebrate Canada Day. Let me wet my whistle one more time. It's going to be fun. That uh, virtual hooking, it's going to be fun. I'm going to be sitting there working on my Monet piece. So to put together tonight's show, I went to a website that's called CanadianArtJunkie.com. Very good site. And I pulled up an article from 2019 by Jay Walters. Uh, that's called 150 years of rug hooking it's not a long article but i use this article as kind of a skeleton or a backbone to put together tonight's show and it has served me well it will serve us well uh, i added a lot to it but i needed something as like just the bare bones and this article really did the trick so again 150 years of rug hooking by jay walters on canadianartjunkie.com now i'm not reading actually the text from the article i was just looking at the artists who he chose to feature in this article um, and i'm going to go through them all with you it's just a handful but it gave me a great idea on where to start judy great to see you hey i hope that you all caught the show on wednesday because i covered judy's new book the new joy of hooking with yarn and it is the book of the year so make sure you go back and watch that uh, episode if you haven't seen it yet. It is truly the most wonderful book. <laughs> People love it when you pop on. Judy's like a celebrity in rug hooking. It's exciting. It's exciting for me too. I'm going to try to show off now. So rug 150 years of rug hooking. These are the people who were covered, and I have a slideshow for you, of course. These are the people who were covered in this article by Jay Walters. So let me switch uh, screens with you for just a minute, and let's just look at what the overview hang on just a second it's not your screen it's me I, I've got a lot of images tonight um, it started here so I'm just going to show you the images that were used for this article Grenfell mission rug right we probably recognize this absolutely beautiful we will talk more about the Grenfell mission but this is an image of the Grenfell mission a Newfoundland and Labrador style rug it is an actual one, but this is an example of one of the patterns that they did, 1935 to 1945. Silk or rayon, cotton burlap, 33 by 45 uh, centimeters, that is. So this was the first image that got me going in this article, and the second image that got me going. This is all from the same article, and these are all of the images in the article. That's why I felt I had to cite the article. Uh, this is an image uh, designed by Clarence Gagnon from Bay St. Paul in Quebec, 1930 to 1940, wool, animal hair, burlap, 70 by 99 centimeters. Um, and I will certainly um, be talking more in this episode about Grenfell and about rugs that have been adapted by the work of Can famous Canadian artist Clarence Gagnon. Now, the third image was is a very new image and i was absolutely blown away i think we might have seen this artist uh in one episode of coffee time or cocktail time um heather goodchild contemporary artist so we will be covering her in great depth um on this show tonight heather goodchild i just think this is <clears throat> an outrageously great image um you know she her work really um represents uh generations of, of storytelling, um, women's kind of domestic work. Um, this really hits on the kind of Hansel and Gretel theme, doesn't it? That sort of baying wolves in the woods and this uh, sort of crone figure in the center. But um, I read also that her work also features uh, symbolism. So this to me looks like almost like the Masonic eye on top. A lot of text in this. It has a fairy tale quality uh, that kind of borders on a woodblock print. It's more e evolved and it doesn't have the illustrative quality of a fairy tale. It does have that biblical snake climbing up the tree. A lot of mystery in this piece. The, the sort of Jacobian flowers on the right hand corners, um, lots of figures, a village scene, a very heavily patterned scene up on top. There's houses and, and coffin shapes, right? There's got to be a lot of symbolism here, as with all of her work. I pulled up a lot of pieces of her work, well, a few pieces that I could find that I thought she doesn't always do rug 
cooking. She does a lot of other mediums and other uh, even textile mediums. So we'll be looking more at the work of Heather Goodchild. I hope that this is not confusing after the trouble that we had last week. Not, I don't think us uh, particularly, but uh, the trouble I had on the page last week. This is a work by Deanne Fitzpatrick, and that is not me. I am Deanna David at Ribbon Candy Hooking. This is by Deanne Fitzpatrick. Uh, and her company goes by her own name in Canada. So she is a Canadian artist. We'll be looking at some of her work. Um, she is pro arguably the most famous, um, you know, living rug hooking artist. She is iconic. Uh, she is very, very famous. She has certainly created um, a, a massive rise in interest for this craft and much of the current popularity of the craft and the renaissance that we're seeing has to do with her participation and her talent. So we will certainly be covering her a little bit in this episode. Uh, this, is, this artist is called Nancy Adele and we have covered her a little bit on Coffee Time but I want to go back to her because she is a Canadian artist and her hook drugs are important and so different than anything else that we've seen um, you know, in, in rug hooking ever. I mean, very, very, these are the storytelling rugs, um, with a lot of sort of action happening, a lot of symbolism, a lot of, in many cases, eroticism. We will come back to Nancy Adele. So these are some of the artists that we're going to be looking at tonight. What I'm going to start by doing, you saw me go back to Grenfell there. I'm going to start by, that is the framework. So the article that I was referring to by Jay Walters on CanadianArtJunkie.com um, those are the images that were used for that article. Those were all of them. So I use those as a stepping off point um, to be able to talk about all of those artists in, in that collection. Sort of cur I hate the word curated, but in that article. Um, and then I built from it to make a even more full and lush show for us. Because in going down these rabbit holes, looking at some of these artists that we just had a glimpse of, it made me think of other Canadian artists. And I thought, oh, we cannot leave out so-and-so, so I added a bunch of other ones, and I thought that will be, um, that'll be a nice full show. So I want to start with Grenfell. Now, I'm not going to go into huge detail with everything, but I pulled, Grenfell is so important because I have already done several shows on Grenfell, and I will always continue to go back to Grenfell and touch on it some more, um, talk about it from time to time, because I think it's important being one of those core things, right? If there was a canon of rug hooking, Grenfell would certainly be included in that canon, right? It would be one of the chapters where all of the rugs appeared and uh, we would be repeating what we know about this moment in time because it's so important to the timeline um, and the history of rug hooking. So I pulled up the website. I'm going to read a short bit here. It's going to be the longest bit that I read tonight, but just to get us going, I pulled up what I think is the most comprehensive information on the Grenfell rug um, 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 project, right, for lack of a better word. So we know in a nutshell, and I'm going to go into it in better detail, we know in a nutshell that Grenfell is a person who uh, arrived in Canada with the hope, uh, saw what living conditions were, with the hope of creating work, projects, industry for people who were living there having a very hard time, a very bad financial kind of a struggle, creating a you know, better sort of financial situation for them where there was a new industry created in the winter months that were already... Um, pretty quiet, right? People could do something during that time that could turn a dollar. Um, that was the idea. So this is a this is a story of a mission. And I'm reading. I paraphrased. It's it's a long bit that they have written up on GrenfellHookedMats.com history. Um, it's a website, so you could easily find that. I just paraphrased here, and I wrote the quiet months of February and March were known as the matting m a t t matting season along the rugged coast of northern Newfoundland and Labrador. You know what, I'm gonna shut, should I shut? Let me see, let me shut this window. Sorry if I'm putting my boobs in the camera, but I feel like the traffic is very loud. Um, the matting season. Uh, it, was, it was a time of respite from the fishing season, decades old by the time the Grenfell mission, mission began. The roots of the mat hooking lay with the founding English and Scottish settlers. And apparently at this time, all the women hooked. So it was already something that was known, right? But they were all hooking different kinds of patterns and sharing patterns. In 1892, when Dr. Wilfred Grenfell arrived from England, he met courageous, hardworking people who were fighting terrible odds against chronic disease, hunger, poverty, and exploitation, meaning making terrible trades, making terrible deals, right? And being worse off uh, with money, with life, with making ends meet. 
From his determination to alleviate their distress, Grenfell's medical mission began. His conviction that outright gifts of money, food, and clothing would not offer any long-term help to the development of a cottage industry that became known as the industrial, right? This is like, this is the kind of shaping it that way and calling it by that name is just a signature of these times, right? The industrial, meaning let's make a project out of this, which is just what he said about doing. Uh, he hoped that they would produce more distinctive handcrafts, including hooked mats, because of course, Canadians tend to say hooked mat rather than hooked rug, as they did then. The mat industry rose to a peak in the late 1920s and early 1930s. It began to decline uh, as the effects of the Great Depression reached the region, fell off dramatically after World War II. That's part of the overarching history that we cover again and again and will always return to. In 1905, Grand... Hey. Hey, Ted, you want to say hi? Hey. Here Mom, he look is. look at the chat. That's me right there. Okay, he was chatting. Jim's official account. But you are Teddy. Okay. Yeah, I didn't make I myself missed something. Ted's official account. Okay. Jim's. Okay. Apparently he has a new login name. Yes. Um, hey, Mom. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So you all saw that before I saw that. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> Hi, Lily. All right. Well, make sure when you leave you... Whatever. Okay. So anyway, 1905, Grenfell met Jesse Luther, an American woman who had set up a sanatorium with craft... Uh, as part of her treatment. And this was a big thing at this time too. Um, as it is now, doing all kinds of physical therapy and rehabilitation, particularly after the wars, particularly with men, uh, experimenting with handcrafts to try to calm down, get to a better sort of zen place, just try to uh, use your hands and your motor skills to override the chaos that was maybe happening in your head. Um, thank you, Linda. Linda says, hey, Teddy. Hey. So, um, Myself. Okay, you're doing your stuff on the top bunk, and I'm doing my show right here, so be quiet, okay? okay. Um, so anyway, this mission starts out as a medical mission, and it turns into this wonderful craft mission. Jesse Luther uh, is, is the big name um, behind the mission, and she starts to design stuff. Uh, the Grenfell rugs begin to have a kind of look to them, right? They have a style, whereas they didn't before. So they were, they were creating patterns that women would do. They could repeat the patterns. And Grenfell himself was doing some of the designing, which is, I think, always an interesting part to the story. Um, so they would design these mats in all different sizes, and women would be able to work on them through these quiet winter months. And it became a very viable business. The industry was successful uh, until the Second World War. And, um, oh, Lynn's trying to find the Judy Taylor book. Judy, if you have a chance, can you put the link to it in the thread? It's on Wednesday's episode in the description, but if it can be in this thread, people can find it just like that. So Grenfell is a imp very important part of Canadian history. It's one of, tonight I'm not talking about Chetty Camp, not because I don't like it. I will return to it soon just because of time. So all of these missions, this one was a little different because it began as a medical mission. And Grenfell really saw when he arrived that it wasn't just like poverty of spirit and medical issues and uh, just general un unwellness. It was um, heavily financial based. The way that people felt, the way that life was going for them, the way that life was treating them. Um, was in a large part based on the sort of whimsical nature of the uh, fishing and whether it was a good year or a bad year. And once he put this plan in place with the industry and women were able to start hooking mats that they could then sell uh, to the tourist trade or even in the U.S. They brought a lot of things to the U.S. and sold them at a little um, shop in Vermont. What did it say? They began hooking blocks and triangles, patchwork style motifs, floral motifs, um, usually with a black border. That's one of the signature things. And Luther, Jesse Luther, started to design things. Instead of just all being willy-nilly medallions and florals, she started to design things that were more appealing to the tourist trade because they had to do with Canada. So, like, for example, deer, seals, uh, walrus, um, jellyfish, ducks, bears, rabbits, um, things that were sort of considered synonymous with Canadian living. So these were popular motifs, and these would sell very, very well. Um, we're going to look at some of them in just a minute, but they were distributed later on. I thought I had, yeah, uh, during the 1930s, mission volunteers uh, toured the resort areas of New England and New York, also holding sales, right? So with these sales, they would bring mats with them, and they would sell huge numbers at one time, one pop. And a retail shop opened in New York City and Philadelphia, and there was something um, um, established a, a tavern called the Dog Team Tavern in Ferrisburg, Vermont in 1931. That was just another venue where they could sell these rugs that were 
um, it, it just extraordinary. It was an extraordinary moment. And I say in the full-length shows on Grenfell how they put the word out at a certain time for silk stockings and began hooking with silk stockings, meaning pantyhose. And they were putting the call out among socialites and the you know higher classes to say, if you have pantyhose that are worn out and you're not going to wear them anymore, please donate them. Uh, and this was an organized kind of a donation. And um, they went up to Canada and were used to hook these beautiful mats. Amazing. Oh, YouTube currently says that the book is sold out. Okay, Judy, if you're there, let us know about that. I don't think it is. It's just coming out, but maybe there was a limited number for the first pop. Teddy, be quiet, please. You have to put a lip zipper on, honey. So, okay, so Judy says on Amazon, not available yet. Um, to my website is fine. Lots of books coming into me, so available forever. So that's good news, isn't it? Um, feet. Feet. So, um... I missed something there. So Judy's website is littlehouserugs.com. So you should be able to find it there. But Judy is right on there. So this is a great opportunity to nail it down, isn't it? So let's look at some of these Grenfell rugs. This is such a huge moment in rug hooking, arguably the hugest, right? So these are what Grenfell rugs look like. And again, the big sort of change in style is when you're making way too much noise, Teddy. You're going to have to leave. I don't know what you're Sorry. doing, but I'm running a show. You're going to have to get out. Sorry. Um, whew, mood turns just like that. Um, as soon as they started doing things stylistically that were a little bit different, that were signature to Canada, the sales, of course, were very, very good. So things like this dog sleds, teams of dogs, um, very popular motifs, as you can imagine. If you're a tourist and you have enjoyed your time there, this is exactly the kind of image that you would like to take home. Um, Let's see. So this one, make the door. You got to fix that. It's making noise. You're you're very disruptive tonight, Ted. Sorry. Um, sorry about that. So this is this image is courtesy of the Cherry C H E R R Y Gallery. Thank you, babe. Um, another image, polar bear. Of course, the polar bears were very popular. You know, there is a huge sort of um, range of prices. This looks like the back of a Grenfell rug, actually that these rugs went for and continue to go for. Images, some images are more popular than others. Polar bears, uh, this one was on first dibs. It had already sold, very popular. Uh, at the bottom left-hand corner, this is the back. You see the tag there, that makes it, he is silly, Lynn, and he's such a love. I know he was looking for something under the dresser, but it might not be the right time. Uh, this is his sister's room also, so that poses other questions if he's hiding things under her dresser. Um, that is the Chetty Camp, I'm sorry, that is the Grenfell tag on the bottom left. So interesting because, you know, when you are buying something that has the kind of value of a Grenfell rug, and really Grenfell rugs on eBay or First Dips or any right, anywhere right now, are going to cost between, I would say, $350 and maybe $1,500, depending on the size and the subject. So there was, and we've talked about this before, I don't know if it's still there, but I'm guessing it is, there is an image of, um, of a man... Um, uh, like battering a seal to death, like with a club, clubbing a seal. So this rug was not, I, I think it was around four, four fifty range, which is, which is a good price for a uniquely sort of Canadian um, theme in a rug. Right? Seal, seal, seal hunting for pelts, uh, perfectly viable and legit subject, right? But I think with times having changed and all that, um, a, a slightly less sort of savory um, and fond type of a subject for people to want to spend money on. So the price of these rugs is always going to depend on the subject, also the condition. And of course, it, it has to be vetted and have some provenance. The best provenance is having that tag on it. Other, otherwise, people can say this is a Grenfell rug and it's really not. And if, it's, if you're sure that it is because it shows all the signs, right, uh, it, you diagnose, yes, it's a Grenfell, absolutely, but it doesn't have the tag on it. It's it's worth getting if you love the subject, but don't buy things for an investment that do not have provenance and do not have the tag because all Grenfell rugs had tags on them. It's very easy for them to have come off, um, but if it's off, you need different provenance if you're paying a lot of money for it. This is the one I use for the thumbnail. Uh, this is called from, uh, oh no, this is from the website. Uh, from Newfoundland and Labrador Heritage. That's its own website, and that is a lovely website. Um, another beautiful image. This is this would be a very popular image. This isn't a monitor problem. It has a lot of horizontal hooking. Hello, Alicia King in Texas. Good to see you. Um, it has a lot of directional hooking. It's much more pastoral. This is not 
real signature type Grenfell rug for me. The style is very different. It does not, this is the full photo. I did not crop it. Um, it didn't appear to have that black border on it, but it must be a Grenfell because it appears on this very serious website where they would have vetted it. Um, but just a very different subject, more of a village subject. This is more of the traditional subject, another dog sled. This one just so pretty, right? The sort of patterned um, white for the snow, the dark border seems to have faded a bit because it was certainly black. The different colors of greens in the trees, you see a lot of directional hooking. It seems very clear um, that this was hooked with nylons just because of the texture. I think you're seeing it larger than I, oh, it was Teddy's feet. It was Teddy's feet, Robin, I missed that, Judy. Teddy's feet. Oh my God. I didn't even notice. My life is so crazy. Uh, so this came from the Edward Thorpe Gallery, right? Beautiful Grenfell. Very, um, very stylish. I mean, look at these dogs. They look almost like Matisse peeper cuts, don't they? The silhouettes are just beautiful. Uh, the motion in this is extraordinary too. There's a lot going, there's a lot going on in here and the color is a bit more whimsical and lighthearted than the color that we often see in Grenfell rugs. So I would think, I, I didn't see a price on this one. It could be that it had already sold, but I would think that one like that would have gone for an extraordinary amount of money. Another Grenfell from First Dibs, uh, a different subject, more like a Maude Lewis theme. Um, it has the black border. I didn't, I didn't see the other photos of this one. It was just this one that was available online. Um, I would really want to see the tag on this one because it is a huge departure from most of the subjects we're seeing in Grenfell rugs. The hooking part looks correct because if you look closely, as closely as you can at the stitches, I'm going to show you a close up in just a minute. It is, um, it does look like it's hooked with silk stockings, right? So that helps. They would have dyed the stockings, uh, in big cauldrons and hooked it, hooked it with those. It's just a very different subject and definitely headed toward the Maude Lewis look. Whereas uh, this is much more the sort of, this Puffins, right? The Edward Thorpe Gallery, another one from the Edward Thorpe Gallery. Uh, it looks like it has some condition issues, but a beautiful image, beautiful color palette, nice sort of patchwork on the bottom. And I have a close up of this one for you. So when we talk about, you love that one, Alicia. It does, it does look like Maine. Let's look at that one again. That really does look like Maine. You know, when I see pretty white houses like that in blue water behind that looks like it might be Casco Bay, and then all of these little dainty flowers, I do think of Maine too, right? And I think one of the things that helps this look like Maine is that the white buildings with the blue trim, right? That has a very Maine look to me. Uh, very symmetrical birds in the sky too, and that is a Grenfell thing. That kind of localized symmetry is a Grenfell thing, composition-wise. But there are other things going on that aren't Grenfell, like the, the patterning of the flowers is very um, loose, right, on the first level that we're seeing, the, the bottom that's closest to us. And then behind that little picket fence, it's a similar pattern, almost like a textile repeat pattern, um, but much smaller scale. So they're doing two different scale of patterning. It's just very odd for a Grenfell. I would really question this one. I'm not questioning for Stibbs or whoever posted it. I'm just saying for me, if I saw this hanging on a wall, it wouldn't immediately say Grenfell to me. It would say hooked with stockings, but it wouldn't immediately say Grenfell to me. Uh, puffins are beautiful. And this is a close up of the puffins. Um, so you can see it looks a little bit different than wool, right? They're skinnier. They're more sort of rectangular. Um, loops that are coming up they're longer long and skinny like Pez right rather than big fat loops so it looks a little bit different it looks like it's a different material and the reason is because it's silk stockings and Grenfell mats are often called silk stockings so that's no surprise I have one more of these Grenfells to show you because I thought this is this is another very uh, unusual subject the Arctic hairs there were many designs that were done with the Arctic hairs patterns um, but with the design of using rabbits, but this is a very busy one. Now this is a Grenfell. Um, it just goes to show there was a wide variety. It wasn't just Jesse who was designing them and Grenfell himself, but his um, wife who came to work and live there, she was designing too. So there were, there were several people who were designing who all had um, real styles, nylons. Yes, nylons, pantyhose. That's, I should be say, like, saying nylons for us here too, because stockings could be uh, much heavier knit, but these are like nylons, like more a, a bit lighter weight. Um, Teddy's feet. So that's the Grenfell story. Um, there's a lot more to say. I do love Arctic hair. It's so unusual, isn't it? And and just the storytelling quality of this piece, which is not. I mean, you do see yes, dog sle sleds and and seals being clubbed, and you do get that level of storytelling. But this could be like a plate from a Beatrix Potter. I mean, there's it's really different. Um, it's really unusual. 
I don't know if the rust color was always the rust color, but the rust with that kind of celery color and then all that pink um, is absolutely beautiful. And then that kind of, it's it's gotta have fade because we're looking at the black border and that clearly has fade. Hello, Susie. But in the back, I love whatever, however it started out color wise, I love the color of the tree against that antique mauve sky. They were probably completely different colors. Judy says silk stockings, yeah. I just love the palette of this one. And I would love to see the back of it, which wasn't available because I'm sure they were completely different colors. But the colors the way they are at this moment for me are absolutely exquisite. Now, the next person that we talked about in our lineup was Gagnon. So maybe I ought to, hold on just a second, maybe I ought to put this photo away for a second and bring you back to the birds, right? That was in the original article that I'm using as the framework for our talk tonight. And Gagnon looked like this, uh, Clarence Gagnon. So this hooked rug um, is a sort of modified based on one of his paintings. Now, there were quite a few painters in the early to mid 20th century Canadian painters who, oh good, I'm glad that's all getting sorted out with the book. That makes me really happy. Colleen, you thought Peter Rabbit, absolutely, right? It looks exactly like that kind of thing. There were a lot of Canadian um, Sorry, let me just pull up to the other one. There we go. Painters at this time who were very, very popular, very appealing to the tourist trade because they did a lot of Canadian uh, village scenes, old inns, beautiful concentrations, clusters of village houses in the snow, uh, sleds coming through with horses. I mean, very, very picturesque, very romantic subjects. Um, there were quite a few of them. And I am gonna spend time doing a whole week of Canadian painters from this period, I would say 1920s to 1950s, who are fairly well known in the US, very well known in Canada, including Gagnon, whose work was routinely used by rug hookers as um, inspiration for a piece that would be modeled immediately and exactly as closely as possible to, my color so weird tonight, isn't it? Um, to the painting itself. Uh, um, I'll see if I can fix that. But let's come back to Gagnon, super handsome man, isn't he? I just thought that this picture, you know, when you see pictures of people like this, um, you know, from a little bit, a little bit of a ways back, I was looking at Monet in detail today. It's just amazing. When I was young, I used to look at these black and white pictures of people from history and I used to think, God, everybody looks so weird, but it's just not true, is it? Um, he's very handsome. I would, I would love to meet this man on the street. He looks lovely. Lily just asked, when is my book coming out? That is a very good question. Um, it should still be coming out later this year, but I actually had to... This is me, get ready. I had to resubmit some of the main pictures for the 14 main rug projects yesterday or the day before yesterday because I did not know, I'm not a technical person, you know that. Uh, I did not know that when I submitted those photos to uh, Fox Chapel that when I, cro I cropped them because I thought they looked prettier, cropped, like neater. There wasn't a coffee cup in the edge of any of them or a foot. Um, so I cropped them because I thought they looked nicer, but I did not know that when you cropped a photo, because I, I have a professional setup, right? So it's it should be fine. When you crop them, it kills the quality of the pictures. So they asked to have all of them wrapped up and sent to Pennsylvania, and I almost died because I was very scared to be separated from the 14 rugs in this book. It's like 14 of my best pieces ever. Um, and it scared me a lot to send them off and, you know, cross my fingers um, so we went back and forth for a few weeks and I said, is there any chance that I could just try again? Um, and then, you know, the agent was not super technical either. And she wasn't saying to me, the problem is that you cropped them. She was saying the size of the picture is wrong. And I was going, I don't know how they can be wrong. I had this setting on whatever, long story short, super boring, too late. Um, I took them all again this week and sent them. So that held things up quite a bit. So we might be looking at later in the autumn or even the winter, but it should it should be soon. The editing department has the book and I'm already working on the next book. So I hope there's I hope there's no more surprises here. That was absolutely my fault, right? Absolutely. Everything is my fault in the end, right? Um, honestly, it, it, whether I admit it or not, it usually is. So Gagnon was um, a very, very well-known painter in Canada, very successful. Uh, in his life, right? People loved buying uh, examples of his work and it was great also for the tourist trade. So in looking at Gagnon's work, I want to talk a little bit about him first. His full name was Clarence Alphonse Gagnon. Uh, his life was between 1881 and 1942. 
Uh, that's not a very long life. He was a French-Canadian painter, draftsman, engraver, and illustrator. Uh, he is known for his landscape paintings of the Laurentians and uh, Charle Charlevoix region of eastern Quebec. Um, so let's look at some of his work. I will go into his story in a lot more detail, and we will look in a lot more detail at his work. This is one of his paintings, and I could not find in a pinch the example of this hooked, but I have seen this hooked many times. Um, I don't know off the top of my head with Gagnon, I do with some of the other uh, Canadian painters from this period, what the situation was with licensing royalties, all that stuff. Sometimes at this point, it was just permission. Can I have permission to use this painting and make it into a hooked rug and make a whole bunch of them and sell them? They were not selling the patterns. They were making them as hooked rugs and selling those. And the, off, the answer was often yes, right? That was called Winter Morning in Bay St. Paul. Uh, this one is called uh, Laurentian Village, and this is uh, 1927. This absolutely appears often on eBay uh, as a hooked rug, and it looks just like this. Um, beautiful storytelling uh, images here. Graphic quality, you know, in keeping with the period of art at the time, but um, nice architectural details that really define it as being a, a village from this immediate region. Tracks in the snow, right? It's not like this uh, lost village where nothing's happening and people are snowbound. Uh, people are coming, coming and going up this street. It gives you comfort, right? There's laundry hanging on the line. Uh, it's a friendly village. It's probably very cold besides being very snowy, but life is happening and everything is, everything is going forward. Uh, really charming images. Uh, and again, almost all of he, his I have seen, not this one, um, done up as hooked rugs. So I think this is an interesting thing to chase if you have time this weekend. I do too, Susie. They are so charming. This one is my favorite. And again, I have not seen this one as a hooked rug. This one is called After the Storm. And it looks like people are on an ice pond and they're cutting ice blocks, right, for, to transport and use for refrigerators and, and um, for preserving food and stuff like that, practical stuff. But what a beautiful composition. I mean, I can't think of, other outside of Maxfield Parish, I can't think of a better example of using pink with blue. Um, it is so soft. The glow is impossible. It is, I mean, it happens. We've all seen this moment, not often enough. But we've all seen this moment, if you live in places with snow, I should say, uh, you know, the, the color of light that is hitting the rooftops is just rose gold. It's just gorgeous. It really, it's like makes you, makes you sure that heaven is there. Absolutely beautiful. Um, the colors of the house is cheerful under the snow. The lighting, Colleen, it's the lighting, isn't it? And those kind of, these are like the skeletal trees of winter that can often be portrayed as very depressing, broken umbrellas, as Stephen Sondheim would say. But in this painting, they look so soft. Don't they look soft and brushy and warm? Ah, the light is just unspeakable. So uh, this moment in Canadian painting is very, very strong for light. So uh, Gagnon and his contemporaries were very concerned with light. As you can imagine, for a good part of the year, there is snow. Um, and they had to get used to painting the snow and in doing so, they would have to figure out ways to create romance and interest and color outside of bleak, you know, white and dark contrast. So being able to have a winter scene that's this deep in snow and have this much charm and color emerging is, I mean, this is just one of the most magical paintings of all time. Warm and cool balance, yep, is perfect. The blues with the pinks. And this, you know, the storytelling is, is so um, thoughtful because it has your eye traveling. It's like you immediately look at that black hole and you, you think, pit, what's the pit? And then it's like, oh, it's the water. It's the ice cold water. And there they are chopping up blocks. You know, and then everybody, I think most people, we weren't really doing ice blocks in my lifetime, but my grandmother had an old Frigidaire from, you know, she was on a list in the Second World War and she got, mom, what brand was it? It wasn't Frigidaire. She, she cried when she found out what brand it was because she'd never heard of it. And she thought, it was going to be a piece of garbage, but it ended up lasting until her death. Um, you know, like, what was it, 10, 15, well, maybe 20 years ago now. So it lasted many, many, many decades. Um, and it, I think it's still actually working in the house with the sun. But, you know, this idea of people cutting up ice and having to bring it into the house, this is certainly within a lot of people's lifetimes, right? This is a piece of storytelling that should never be lost in history. Hey, Jody. Um, and you're looking at them cutting and you're looking at the patient animal waiting. He's all yoked and he's waiting with some blocks 
and he's going to follow that path of the animal before him with those ice blocks heading up that little gentle hill. Uh, he's going to be following in those footsteps and he's going to be bringing the ice. It's just a beautiful moment in time. Uh, it tells a whole story and then up at the village probably people in those nice rosy cozy houses uh, having warm drinks making mats right it's just charming Ganya is fantastic he is he is one to look up Clarence Ganya G A G N O N Kelvinator thank you mom it was the famous Kelvinator it sounds like a superhero or a villain doesn't it the Kelvinator um, yeah that thing worked for ever that thing worked forever. We are coming up to, I lost my place again. I'm telling you, I'm going to come to you for a minute because I just need to, I need, just need to have a drink. It is so hot. Um, that Kelvinator lasted and lasted and lasted. And you know, it's so funny. Do you sometimes wonder and, and think to yourself, so many memories that I have, I, I wonder if they actually happened, right? Is this the, is this the words of a true psycho? Um, sometimes I wonder how much, as I get older, I cross things that I read in books, things that I saw my grandmother doing with things that I read in books, right? Like books about colonial America, right? Which obviously would have been a very different world. But I wonder how many of those things I, I cross in my head when I think back and I think, oh, I can picture Graham doing that. And, and then I think, can I? Or did I, did I make that up? Am I like embroidering that on? You know what I mean? It's just, it's hard. I guess memory is, is a fleeting thing. Uh, but also with so many years going by, uh, it's hard to grasp at those stories and those, those bits of storytelling. But when you see a picture like that, it evokes a lot of stories from the past. It makes you remember things you haven't thought of in forever. Mm. Um, oh, it was beautiful, wasn't it? Um, so let's move on to Heather Goodchild. Uh, are we doing Heather Goodchild? Let me see. Let me just make sure. I'm sure that this is her because it's so distinctive. I just want to be absolutely sure. Let me see. Yeah. Okay, so this is a P Heather Goodchild. Um, she was born in 1977, so she's, she's, she's a living artist. Uh, she's a Canadian costume designer and artist, and she, she does a lot of painting and a lot of different textile art, a lot of installation. She is very popular. She is quite well known. She is in those uh, sort of elite, deservedly so, artistic circles. Uh, she's having a very busy career right now. Um, lots going on, and she's producing phenomenal and unique work and that work includes hooked rugs. So recurring themes in her work include symbolism, rituals, regalia, societies, like that's what made me think of the Masons with the eye on the other one that we saw, traditions, morality, and personal fulfillment. She was born in Toronto in 1977, so she is five years younger than me, so I guess she's 45. Uh, her website is fantastic. It's called heathergoodchild.com. And this is a lovely piece from this year, 2022, called Old Friends. Uh, I know that you can see this larger on your monitor than I can on mine, but um, when I was looking at this piece, I just, I just fell to pieces. I absolutely couldn't believe what I was looking at. There were so many layers to it. This type of rug hooking does not follow any of the traditional rules of the 20th century, right? And I'm so glad that it doesn't. This is, you know, when we talk about our, our tips and tricks and hints, um, we talk about putting compositions together. I, I don't do this with my composition classes because I understand there is, there is such a wide gamut in, in even every artist you can name's um, um, catalog of work, but also ability. And with something like this, we are looking at an absolute fusion of pattern design, somebody who is obviously heavily influenced and in love with textile so it's not surprising to find that she is a costume designer she's very very heavily um, inspired by textile I mean when you look at those kind of yellowy lemony flowers with the kind of zebra lines that is very deco very art deco and then those kinds of flags of color that could be picnic bla uh, blankets I can't read it I can't read the story she knows the story I know it's filled with symbolism um, it's absolutely beautiful. I, I love allowing my eye to travel up those pink and white striped textiles, uh, up through the plants, right, and the zebra uh, cross hatching and all that stuff, right up to the characters. There's two pairs of characters, one in red silhou silhouette, another bit of patterning right in the center, sort of black and uh, brown and gray, very geometric, um, um, very Macintosh style patterning. 
and in the sky again oh excellent there's someone talking about cheap sex that's fantastic um, so if you have a chance, maybe if anyone's on, if you could block that, that would be good. It's hard, it's hard to figure it out on this end with the screen. Um, excellent. Wow. Okay. He's busy. So another sort of pattern in the sky, the blue and white, very soft colors, very interesting piece, lots of geometry, but also lots of soft lines, clouds in a kind of rosy color, not a cloud color. There's a color shift here. Everything is a different color than you would expect it to be. And instead of settling for definitely spam duty, I know there's a lot of viewers that are always fast with removing these and blocking them. So I'm going to just, I, I know that that's going to happen. Um, hopefully sooner rather than later because, yeah. What an awesome visitor, right, to the rug cooking show. Um, but I love how instead of doing, for example, silhouettes in black and outlining in black, she shifted the color to like pink and white. Just very unusual, very different very different work 2022 this piece was done last year thank you linda um spring garden 2021 so this is very different than the piece we just looked at and yet if you think about it she has made some significant color shifts she is still using gray as the main primary color in place of black right so that gives you a, a, a medium color as your baseline rather than black um, which creates instead of having a primary driven palette i'm not going to get too technical and composition-y but this one definitely has much to look at. Absolutely, Alicia, that last one was just filled with interest. I could be standing in front of that, the, this last one that we were looking at for, I mean, I'm not a good museum person. I get super antsy and I like to see a few things and I like to go find a cafe or, or walk around. But this is something I could stand in front of for a really long time because there's so many layers. There's so many patterns in there. Um, it keeps your eye very busy, very searching. And it's not, it's not given to you, is it? They're not, the story is not given to you. It is not rabbits coming out of a tree, bouncing around, right? Happy that it's springtime. Um, this is uh, embedded, right? So you would either read the plaque that was there, put, layer your own interpretation of it on, which is a lot of fun and a very inspiring and creative project to give yourself in a museum setting. This is a lot more straightforward, Spring Garden 2021, because it's obviously it's much more literal. Uh, beautiful uh, daffies coming up uh, in a kind of a wild, kind of a, um, I don't want to say violent, but a very sort of dark, almost grotesque background. So for me, that's a huge contrast. These very hopeful, cheerful, colorful flowers um, popping up against a background that has a bit of the grim fairy tale look to it, doesn't it? Um, it, it almost looks like a sketch that has been transferred. Lots of um, crossing and cross hatching, and it has a sketch quality to it. But then in the center where those flowers are, your eye keeps coming back to them. It keeps traveling these kind of almost grotesque movements of the branches, these unresolved uh, branches coming up out of the ground. But then you come back to the center and there are those dear old daffies again. And the, you think of spring and you think of hope and you think of that nice time of year where the weather finally relaxes and gives you a break um so there's a lot there's this for me this piece uh not such a story not such a landscape or a still a still life but for me it's more of a feeling you know every piece is different the last one seemed like a story piece to me that i was only experimenting with what the what the uh, story was for her and different story for me but this is more like this gives me a vibe and i like the vibe it's got a lot of motion it's got a lot of light there's a lot of contrast and conflict, right? So for me, that it feels interesting. This is another very cool one. I like this one a lot. I like this one as much as the uh, old friends, at least. This is called Be Behind Theodoric's Curtain, 2021, last year. Uh, and this is another one. This one's a bit more straightforward for me. I don't, I don't get the symbolism here. I know this probably refers to a story, a myth, something like that. Uh, maybe a literary reference that I'm not getting, but it does have a, certainly a theatrical feel to it because of the curtain on the left. There's also uh, sort of a rug pattern in the on the bottom left, that circular pattern that gives a great, there are two round shapes, right? That rug type pattern and then the horizon line itself that are both round. And they create a lot of interest because they fan out at different angles, right? Two round shapes, very inviting, very... Um, soft right very approachable but that bottom one that could be a rug pattern also reminds me of like an aztec calendar doesn't it or a mosaic 
somewhere outside Rome, right? Like one of Ostia Antica, one of these places with mosaics all over the ground. You know, it's got a lot of interest and it certainly has a theatrical bend because there are architectural elements um, like possibly the rug, the curtain, right? So it's almost like you're looking out the window or you are inside of something. Uh, and there's a gate, a very ornate gate in the background that cannot be confused for trees. And it's in that rose color that she seems to like a lot. Robin, I saw these at the Hooked by Design exhibit in Wisconsin. You are kidding me. Oh, that is amazing. Was that, that wasn't something that just happened, right? That wasn't the most recent, no. Was that the one that was like six months ago kind of thing? I mean, I just find, I just find this work amazing. Um, the background for me with all of these kinds of uh, cypressy trees, all of these colors at odd angles, again, it's like weather doing crazy things in the background and yet flowers thriving and being very docile and sweet in their pretty pink pastels. Basket weave um, container of some sort that doesn't look like a basket, looks more like a cement potter, that kind of thing. And of course, the main thing is the silhouette of the goat <clears throat> and something that looks almost like a palm leaf heading in. Now, because she is so... Um, textile oriented, right? Um, she is playing with lots of shapes and they don't have to have meaning in a composition. She can simply lay them out in the order that she likes them. She knows what she means. She knows what Theodoric's, Theodoric's curtain is about. Um, oh, I want to see what Juliet says. Juliet, you always put great spins on things. Juliet says, I think that the black in the bottom right is like evil chasing the goat. Okay, that sounds great hidden inside the palace representing not all not all as glorious as it appears oh i like that you are so good at this you are so good at this i like that interpretation you see what i mean it's so much fun to give something your own spin that is fantastic the one in february robin okay oh man i'm gonna have to look at those photos again i'll pull those up robin if you have time can you write something on that post in the rug cooking and punch and needle club so it comes back to the top and i'll pin it to the top so we can look again um, I love that interpretation, and it's so much fun. I see, you see that pansy flower in that bouquet? I keep looking at it because it looks like a mean face. It looks like an evil face, doesn't it? A bit of like a Star Wars thing happening in there, like it's, it's someone evil peeking out from the otherwise, like, very, very straightforward pink flowers. But I see a weird face in there, too. It does have, like the daffies, some kind of element of threat, right? There is something a bit wild happening. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I like this interpretation. The goat is springing away. You know, there is that boundary of the gate on the other side. And I wonder if we go along with this metaphor, um, it would be interesting to say escaping from whatever the castle represents, um, whether it's greed or, or, uh, too much wealth or unkindness or whatever it represents beauty and the beast kind of a castle, uh, is the goat going to run into that barrier? That is the fence. Is that going to be a problem? Is that another threat? It's the Wicked Witch. Yeah, I love it. I love it. It's a, it's a lot of fun to play this game. You know, we should do this sometime on Coffee Time. Maybe Cocktail Time's better. Um, the other ones are bleeding and hurting. Oh, I like it. I like it. We should do this. We should look at some very unusual, very artsy uh, rugs and, and play this game where we, we come up with ideas in the, in the thread for what we think is going on. Wouldn't that be a lot of fun? And great for designing, right? Um, so this is another one of Heather's, another absolute beauty. This is called Flowers for Margaret, 2018. This has more of the feel of the spring garden, right, with that gray background. She likes that gray base. I like how she goes to the dove gray and the blue gray. Really, really pretty because one is like, well, they're both neutrals, right, but the blue gray has a very different feel than that dove gray has. They're both beautiful colors next to each other, and they weirdly don't match. And then she's got a kind of rosy brown in there, which is introducing the warm to the cools. Um, creating again a lot of upset, a lot of contrast. Uh, there is a little row of black coming in on the top left, straight down the top left hand side, very feathery, um, almost like a sketchbook, right? Coming in on the side of sketching part of a frame. Lots of stopping and starting here. Again, more of these leaves and silhouette. Um, really, it would be a blast. I think we should do that. Another great combo of what looks like maybe pine cones or berries, like kind of an autumn bouquet. Um, in a little vase, very simple vase, right? Not something ostentatious, but very small bouquet. It looks like it, to some degree, has had it. it. Looks like a piece already broke off, but it is a very different still life. And I would argue again, despite the fact that this is a still life, this has this this rings as more of a mood piece to me than a still life. It's very very different. 
So in other words, the reason that I brought up um, this artist, Heather Goodchild, is because number one, we don't talk about her. I was not aware of her, I have to admit. Maybe once or twice we talked about her and then I let the ball drop and I should have been chasing to find out what else she was working on because she is completely different, right? Monty Python, now for something completely different, very different. And it just goes to show you, it really, really serves our purpose as hookers um, to support everybody who's doing any kind of hooking work. It doesn't have to be traditional to be correct, right? You can go so far with this as a medium, uh, take it anywhere that you want to take it, tell your story just the way that you want to tell it. You don't have to follow the rules, the traditional rules, and you don't even have to follow the rules of composition. You can, if what you love is textiles, you do draping and you place things the way that you want to place them and you drop those colors in the way that you want to drop those colors in and you will end up with a piece that speaks to you, that you love, that is so meaningful. And it doesn't matter if the rest of us get it and it doesn't matter if the rest of us like it. It doesn't matter at all. I, do, I don't like all of Heather's as much as, for example, uh, the first one I showed, the fairy tale one, um, and I liked that, um, the one that, the old friends, right? I didn't understand it, but I just liked it. I liked the way it made me feel, and I liked seeing all those patterns next to each other. Um, Alicia says, that's what I was thinking, even the other flowers. See, it evokes all kinds of feelings and thoughts and associations. And those are things to jot down during these shows because, you know, I just looked at that last image that we were just looking at and I thought, Cat's Gallery, uh, freedom, absolutely. Um, appropriate on Canada Day, right? I was just thinking, at looking at this one, you know, it is not your traditional um, still life based with flowers. It does look like one of the leaves dropped off um, you know, when you agonize with a still life about getting the leaves absolutely perfect, making sure you can see this one behind, make sure it still looks like a leaf, make sure that flower is being featured right, that they're symmetrical, you know, then you see something like this and you think, how, how did, how is this possible? Because it looks great. It's a still life with a very sort of lackluster bouquet happening. And why shouldn't it be? Because this in itself becomes a metaphor. I look at this as beautiful sort of milk glass vessel. Um, so creamy, right? So creamy and comforting, but the bouquet less comforting, very meager, like Charlie Brown Christmas tree meager. Um, and it does make me think of this moment in autumn where you do feel so happy that it's not hot anymore and there's colors everywhere and it's so beautiful, but you are walking into winter and you remember what other winters were like and sometimes they're super hard and they're super bleak. And this picture for me looks like an autumn bouquet that has those feelings and that fear, that threat of winter, the part that I'm, I'm always scared of every year, that I'm gonna start feeling awful and sad and depressed and not like myself for months. <clears throat> and yeah, you know, it evokes something different for each person, but it just goes to show you, when you do a composition like this, you don't have to have a big lush bouquet, right? It doesn't have to be that, it doesn't have to be the tapestry picture. She makes up for what is not in that bouquet composition with this wildly exciting background, right? Full of movement, full of shadow. And this is not shadow that has been dropped in place because she's got a light shining on a bouquet. She's got a still life set up in her studio. No, she put the central motif in, which is the vase, and then she dropped in colors behind it. And she was not doing the colors according to where the shadows would actually fall. So don't get too crazy about those elements because if you say to yourself, well, look, I'd like to connect this top dark leaf with this bottom dark leaf, and I'm gonna create something that's shaped like uh, an, uh, an air gun, right? Like a big, or like a big um, garden hose on the side. And I'm gonna make that whole pocket that I just sketch out for myself, kind of hit or miss style. I'm gonna make that whole pocket a bit more blue, a bit more stone blue uh, than the rest of the gray. And on the left-hand side, to counter that, I'm gonna put a very different color, uh, an opposite color. I'm gonna put a little yellow in, in between a couple of those flowers. There's no, and then on the bottom, a little bit more red, going more toward rose, more toward the sort of brown, dried blood type colors, uh, more unsettling colors. So there's no reason why you shouldn't do this in the background. This is not a traditional hit or miss, and this is not traditional drawing with the shadows falling as they should. This is option number three. This is uh, what's behind door number three. So be thinking about this too, especially when you post pictures of the rugs that you're working on, and then criticize them and say, um, oh, this is one more from her. 
uh, and then criticize them and say, look at I screwed this up, my shadows are all wrong, it doesn't look right, then the, the follow through thought is going to be, does it have to look right? If it has to look right for you, then it does. But make sure that you're not making it look right for us, because we also like what we just saw. Now that was the last one I had for, do I hear another person coming? Is that you, Joss? That might be Teddy with his feet. I will let him be, let, let the lying dogs lie, right? Um, this is a last one from her, and this one, uh, very different again. I guess this speaks to sort of her love of myth and symbolism, right? This one is called, I will come to you in a thick cloud. Okay, so Juliet, I'm gonna leave this one to you. This one's very different. This certainly does kind of look, at first I thought flying nun characters on the right, but then I thought they look a bit more sinister than that. Um, and there definitely is something going on with this kind of wing, winged mythical character. Um, he's either got an itch somewhere really unlucky, um, or there's an anatomy thing going on where there is no head. And again, this might have a reference to a very specific thing that I don't understand. Um, but the image itself, I think, is very attractive. That wing is really powerful. It has almost like a re religious associations for me. Again, I don't understand. There seems to be kind of a, a druid circle happening down below on the bottom left without the stones, kind of like a meeting, um, almost like a, a ceremonial feel, a ominous, sinister kind of ceremonial feel for me with those figures in black on the edge of what appears to be a very deep cliff. There could be all kinds of things happening here. These could be furies, these could be banshees, these could be many things in purple, um, but they are a bit ghoulish. And when I look at the face of the one in the front, there does seem to be like a like a smiling skeletal type face, very sinister. Um, and even that cloud, beautiful and round as it is, it looks sinister, doesn't it? I mean, I love the shape of it. I've never seen a cloud shape like that with that beautiful silver lining is deceptive. It's so crisp underneath. It seems like everything's gonna be okay. But then you look underneath and there's those figures standing on the edge of a cliff. A lot of beautiful directional hooking in here. Uh, in the body of this sort of blonde winged beast in the center, beautiful directional hooking. Uh, beautiful directional hooking in the, the characters on the right. Certainly in the sky on the left, it has a tapestry feel. This is hooked, but it does have a tapestry feel with the color changes. Oh, Lynn says, I have seen that headless wing character somewhere. Interesting. I would love to know what that is. I just, I just have no idea. Uh, Juliet says, I'm seeing it as a rejection of a blind following of a mother fighter. Absolutely could be. I love how the character is standing on the edge of the precipice. I wonder if he's being pushed off the precipice. Could that be what's going on here with all of these characters very close behind a mother figure? Yep. There's beautiful directional hooking on the bottom right too, right top to bottom in the cliff, the cliff side going into the pre precipice. Beautiful. I will come to you in a thick cloud. It might be worth Googling that phrase. That might be something literary that, or, or you know, from a poem, still literary, but um, it might be a specific reference that would give us a clue. Not that we have to know, right? Not knowing is part of the fun. Dion Fitzpatrick. So you can clearly see that this is a different person than me, not to beleaguer the point, but I had a lot of trouble this week with somebody who, um, getting really aggressive with me, uh, claiming that I am the same person. Um, I'm definitely not. Um, Deanne Fitzpatrick has been in the business a lot, Deanne Fitzpatrick, a lot longer. Her brand is legendary and enormous. I am a much smaller brand. I am a one person company. Um, she has, as I said at the beginning, done a tremendous amount for the rug hooking world. Um, her style is so painterly, artistic, uh, absolutely unique to her. Uh, she does a lot of Canadian scenes. Um, she's got an empire, right? So it, I want to read a little bit about what's... I pulled up her website. I was not able to pull a lot of her images offline because they're locked, right? I should probably figure out how to do this and be a little bit professional too, but I haven't figured it out yet. On her website, her images are locked, so I could not share them in this way. Oh, gosh. Okay, wait a minute. Let's go back. I don't want to spoil this. So we've got some info. Oh, Colleen says it looks like a griffin without the eagle head. It absolutely does. And Eugenia says the headless winged creature in Chinese mythology stands for chaos. Oh, that's fantastic. And Karen put in Exodus 19.9. So that must be where that um, line comes from. This is really evolving, isn't it? Um, I love Deanne Fitzpatrick too, Juliet. 
And Aileen says, it is a Bible statement the Lord said to Moses. So it's a quote, I will come to you in a thick cloud. I'm not sure that's what you want to hear from the Lord, is it? Uh, the Lord speaking to Moses. This is so interesting. You know, this is great information, Agenia. This is great information. Chinese mythology uh, representing chaos. I can absolutely see that. Aileen writes, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe in you forever. Well, that is really beautiful, isn't it? Isn't that beautiful? And also believe in you forever. That's gorgeous. Oh, I love that. That's so much more meaningful. Thank you for doing that research um, during the show. That makes it super exciting. I love that. I'm going to check the thread in case anything else pops up. But that seems like an amazing um, bit of um, uh, interpretation, right? That makes a lot of sense out of, out of an image that is a bit challenging, was a bit challenging for us, for me. So I went on to Deanne Fitzpatrick's website, and it is vast, and it is amazing, and she's got classes and products and kits, and she's great for beginners. She's got a magazine. She's done books. She's done everything. I mean, she is a proper celebrity of rug hooking, and I'm sure you know who she is. So I went on to her site, and I pulled off some of her texts. So this is direct, directly from her site, because um, I wanted to know more about her personally, and I'm, I'm sure that you do too. Maybe some of you in Canada have met her, right? Um, and it said at the top of her Deanne Fitzpatrick Studio page, Deanne Fitzpatrick Studio is a rug hooking studio located in Amherst, Nova Scotia, founded and owned by artist Deanne Fitzpatrick. The studio features one of a kind hooked rugs, hooked rug kits, patterns, and supplies. The space also offers a community for rug hookers and fiber artists to connect. Um, and then I pulled up the page that said Deanne's story, and I really liked this. Um, and it says, uh, rug hooking changes people. So I think this is written by her. I think it must be. It says, so many times I have heard, I have heard people, uh, from people that rug hooking changed them. As they started rug hooking, they began to see the world differently, started noticing beauty around them. Hooking rugs allowed them to express themselves, to use their time wisely and creatively, and opened up a whole new community to them. Rug hooking is full of possibilities. It has changed my life and been a powerful force in changing the lives of the people I have met through it over these 25 years. It has made me who I am. I started out as a therapist thinking that was how I would spend my life helping people, but rug hooking found me and helped me find myself. And then she talks about a little bit. Oh, Colleen says, I saw her at AFA in Cleveland, 2017. Great speaker, I bet. She seems super powerful, super positive. She also seems very accessible as a personality, as a human being. Uh, she wrote, how I got started. I grew up in Freshwater, uh, Placentia Bay, I hope that's how you say it, uh, Newfoundland, the youngest of seven children. My mother and both of my grandmothers hooked drugs as a pastime and as a chore of necessity. By the time I was born, both of my grandmothers had died, and I'm going to come back to you here. Both of my grandmothers had died, and my mother had long since abandoned drug hooking as a chore of poverty. I think this happened to a lot of people during this time, right? It was like once you could afford to buy things that were ready-made, you would not want other people seeing um, that you were making your own stuff because it would um, suggest that you couldn't afford to buy it, right? So this is like the badge of shame, the scarlet letter for a lot of people, I think, of that generation. In Newfoundland in the late 60s and early 70s, few people were hooking, though there was, there was still a scattered mat hanging about people's back doors. For the most part, it was out with the old and in with the new. I can still see a Rita Murphy. Uh, this is a person, Rita Murphy. My, mother, my friend's mother is sitting in her back room, hooking away on her mats. Her floors were a carpet of many multicolored hooked rugs. At the time, to me, it seemed like an old-fashioned thing. Little did I know that I would spend years doing exactly the same thing. I learned to hook drugs, hook drugs because I wanted rugs for an old farmhouse where I had settled. It began as a purely practical craft for me and it later turned into an art. So she's got a lot of really beautiful um, biographical um, information on her website, a lot about her um, that is so um, is sort of introspective and inspiring and really helps you get to know her, get a feel for what she's like because she is iconic. Um, there's a lot more, but I'm also keeping an eye on the time a little bit. Let me see. Yeah, this is all here for you. Oh, I, yep, I see. Um, I'll just read this part. It says, I, I, I printed it, so I might as well read it because it's very sweet. It was a simple technique 
Um, oh, wait a minute. No, I want I don't want to skip this. She said, though I didn't know how to hook, it was something that I'd always been familiar with. As a teenager, I began seeing rugs for what they were. I marveled that a woman's hand had pulled up every loop in the rug that lay on the floor of my sister's farmhouse. In my mid-twenties, I went to an annual meeting of the Rug Hooking Guild of Nova Scotia, and Marianne Kennedy taught me the basics, how to cut your wool, how to pull up a loop. Then she told me to get on with it. As soon as I started hooking rugs, I knew it was for me. It was a simple technique, and I could see my progress. I finished my first little stamped pattern within a week, and so it began. For me, Marion was the right teacher. She gave me the supplies, showed me the basic stitch, and said, now you do it. Finish the rug. Her simple style of teaching made a huge difference in my learning. Now, that is the thing, isn't it? Because how many times have we heard stories about people who started hooking like in the 70s, and they got a teacher who was pulling all their work out, um, shaming them, essentially, and then they stopped hooking for the next 30 years. Like That is not a story that you want to hear right? as a rug hooker. Um, but she talks about this great teacher and, and using, um, she said, I work full-time as a rug hooking artist. Oh, it's the other one. It's the other one. Happy, co happy cocktail night, right, from Jocelyn? Hi. Aw. She said, each piece I create is different from the last. I use recycled cloth, gather old wool clothing uh, from real people in real communities. Uh, the clothes are washed, dried, and torn apart. Fix that fan. Fix that fan. Jocelyn, fix that fan. Uh, in real communities, the clothes are washed, dried, and torn apart. It is then hooked, fix it, loop by loop on the backing of burlap or linen. Um, so I think that's really nice. Very, you know, so many things that she says in these pages, because I read like all of it, um, really reiterates feelings and, and thoughts that we have about hooking and the way that we should approach rug hooking, particularly with new people, is a philosophy. It's, it's, a, it's a, for me, it's a craft, right? It's a craft. Just get on with it. This is how you pull up a loop. You're going to be doing a lot of those. That's the only stitch. Just get on with it. Make it the way you like it. If you like them pulled up high, pull them up high. If you like them low, pull, if you like a variety, do both. Um, but, you know, but other people are more technical and they want a little bit more um, steering and guidance technically so that they can get more effects that are very precise. So it really depends on how you like to hook. But just getting the basics down is very, very easy if you're watching as a beginner. Sue so says, the 10 minutes have turned into over an hour for me. Oh, Eugenia says, I'm also doing the 10-minute challenge. Oh, they've turned into, I see what you mean, over an hour. Because once you sit down and get going, I mean, it's hard to stop, isn't it? Like so many things in life. I started watching, have you been watching the series um, Only Murders in the Building with Steve Martin and Martin Short? I watched the last season in like 24 hours. And I don't know if they dropped the whole season in yet, but I realized that they were available last night. Um, and I watched two in a row and I thought, I have got to stop. I'm not going to be able to stop. I said one hour and one hour turned into two hours. And I could have sat there all night because it is a wonderful, funny, exciting series. Juliet says, I love it when your kids make cameo appearances. I'm very grateful that she was dressed for that. We sent Kaz a bunch of videos earlier, and she was not dressed at all. She had her underpants on, and that was it. But I have to say, if yesterday, let me just take a quick drink. Mm. It is so hot. If you're on the Facebook group, you might have seen, I took, I took the day off yesterday because I went into New York City with the kids. Uh, it was hot. And I was, um, you know, I we, they've been begging me to go and I went, they really wanted to go. School's out, it's summer. They wanted to check out the Nintendo store in Times Square and Rockefeller. And we haven't gone for a while. So I drove the car right into Times Square, which I'm totally fine doing. A city like New York where everything's at a right angle, I have no problem driving right into the city. It was super easy parked in Times Square, gave the guy my keys because they don't let you park your car anyway. And we just walked off and started doing some shopping in Times Square, went to Rockefeller. There's no skaters there at this time of year, but there's roller skaters there. I thought that was really nice in place of the cafe, if you know that area. FAO Schwartz, the toy store, it was so, so much fun. And I pulled what my sister calls a Mrs. Maisel, if you watch that series. That is, I think, my all-time favorite series. I'm just, I'm loving it. I'm, I'm just finished the latest series, so good. But um, Mrs. Maisel is like um, um, a Jewish woman in the 1950s, now 1960s in the show. And she is hilarious. She's fantastic. Uh, she's a comedian. I mean, she's really, uh, there's nobody like her, right, in her world. But um, whenever she goes out with her kids, she always has like a babysitter or the maid with her. And my sister said, like, what are you, Mrs. Maisel, bringing a babysitter into the city with you? And I said, yes, because it was so much, I was going to go by myself with the kids. And then I thought, you know, it's so much easier 
our, they love our babysitter. We've known her. She was babysitting for us when she was 13 because she's more mature than I am. And um, it was a pleasure having an 18-year-old for company. She was super excited. She was great with the kids. And everywhere we went where the kids would just scatter, like behavior off, rules gone, just scatter. She'd say, I'm staying with Teddy. And I'd say, I got Joss. And then, you know, she knows how to use the phone. So I'd be texting her. We're on the fourth floor of FAO Schwartz. She texts back five seconds later. We're on the second floor. I'll be there in a minute. I thought, my God, this is worth every penny. I mean, you just, I, can you imagine me alone with these two kids in the city, 50 years old, ancient mother trying to make it work? I would not be here. I would be, I would be in some kind of a bedlam situation today. Anyway, so just let, just like my monkeys, <laughs> Alicia. Oh, they are fun though. They are fun. You love that show, Robin. It's so good. Oh, man, it was a fun day yesterday. It really was. So let's look at, like I said, I wasn't able to pull a lot of Deanne, Fitz, Deanne Fitzpatrick's images because they are locked. But you can go look at them on her website, as you should. Um, this one I found, some of these were on Pinterest, right? So you never know where they're coming from. But, you know, it's a, it says it's a Deanne Fitzpatrick called Big Red Pot. I was able to kind of peel this one to share it just so if you're not familiar with her, which is unlikely um, because she's so big. You get a feel for her colors, like blue, yellow, red. These certainly are signature colors for her. Oh, Suze, I'll show you in a second. Thank you for noticing. Uh, seven Trees. This is another beauty. She does a lot of landscapes, um, and they are so gorgeous. She does her own colors, right? She does colors the way that she wants to. It's very sort of fauvist slash impressionist. Uh, it's really lovely. She's very shape-driven, very graphic. But she uses, uh, she always does sort of some literal placement of colors, and then in other places not at all. For example, the foreground. Really beautiful. This is really a signature look for her. Um, so interesting. And this is another one I found on Pinterest, a real close-up. She also does this a lot. This is the top of a cottage, I think, in the foreground, and kind of a cliff in the distance with water in the middle. I don't know if she hooked these pieces, but they are her designs. She often does kind of a Millie Fury um, pattern in the sky. So we're seeing that here. Sometimes she does Paisley. This is more like a Millie Fury. Oh, Aileen says the seven trees representing herself and seven sisters. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, that is beautiful. You know, she does a lot with landscapes, but also with people. And her people have very anonymous faces. Um, in, in other words, no features. And I really like, I really like that because I get very lost when I when not lost but I pause for a really long time when I see a face I'm always trying to read the face um, so when there isn't a face I like it because it serves as a placeholder but my eye can travel and not get really mired in um, in what's going on within the person because that sometimes that's not the story um, so this is a real signature look for her too okay this is another one um, birds to flowers uh, from Fog Forest Gallery. That's where I got this one, Fog Forest Gallery. So another pretty one with clouds that are kind of shaped like birds. Um, but I mean, one of the things that I love that she does, this, I mean, everything she does, I love. But one of the things I love is she works very much in the British tradition of hooking. Um, she works with yarn, also wool strips. Um, but when she's working with any, any materials, she does a lot of mixed fibers. So we're not just talking about wool cut to a number three or number four, right? It doesn't have that kind of um, very synonymous, very same kind of feel happening. She does a lot of mixy, mixy matches and you get fibers that are all um, lacy and, and light and others that are feathery and furry, like the, the faux fake fur stuff and the eyelash stuff. And, um, and then the wool, the very durable, you know, heavy wools. It's a real mix. And for me, that variety is exciting to see in one piece. And, you know, we don't do a lot of that in the U.S. We're getting more into trying it out. Um, that is going to be something that the hooking with yarn class I'm about to do is going to include a lot of different kinds of yarn. But it is nice to experiment with, particularly for wall pieces that are meant to be hung up and not tread upon. Um, it is nice to have that kind of variety because using different kinds of fibers, wild ones, traditional ones, creates um, so much more interest for me depends on the subject but if your subject is a simple landscape and you've just got like a cottage and a couple of flowers um, a, a simple strong composition like that can handle having the busyness and the wildness of a lot of different fibers it absolutely can a busy composition is a different story a lot might get lost but with simple clean lines good design 
a good design can handle anything and you can go absolutely wild with different materials and it is fun too and that's what the brits have always done and that's what the canadians have always done so very different and distinct schools of st of uh hooking <gasps> oh i must knock down my water on my phone um among us alicia says 50 here also until the 15th um her way to capture texture yeah Juliet, that's it, isn't it? Capturing texture uh, and variety is amazing. It's by using a lot of different materials. Um, and that is, a, that is a great way to approach, isn't it? Because it turns you into a real magpie in your own life, pulling from all kinds of different things. I remember in Judy's book, when we were looking at it the other day, that sweater that she showed that had like a floral motif on it. It was like a black sweater with like big shapey mod kind of flowers on it. And the person who made it, I forget the person's names, Valerie, something like that had undone it, taken the, the material, taken the wool right out, unraveled the sweater, and like, for example, used the red in the flower and drew the exact same flower, do you remember this, onto a rug, and used the flower from the sweater to hook that rug with the same wool. And she did it for the whole rug. She recreated the main motifs of the sweater, like a beloved sweater that maybe has had it, onto the rug. Um, and I thought that was just a beautiful tribute to maybe a holiday sweater, a sweater that doesn't fit anymore, someone else's sweater that's maybe not here anymore. Lots of times that you could use something beautiful like that, that trick. But thinking about pulling material out of everything that you see is exciting and turns you into a magpie. And it is a good, healthy thing to build your stash by finding bits and pieces all over the day. Because if you've got a day of errands ahead of you and it's just not very attractive, right? Uh, not very inspiring to think about. And you end up going out and making a few stops. Um, was it, not Juliet, who went to the dollar, Whitney went to the dollar store the other day. And she, while she was there, she grabbed a bunch of ribbons. And she's doing proddy with those ribbons. It's just when you have your antenna up and you're open to different materials, all kinds of materials, everywhere you go, you go, oh, look at that. Look at that Mylar balloon. I think I'll have that. And you put it into your stash. And you don't have to feel bad about it. Unless somebody has to come to the house and undig you, you don't have to feel bad about it. Um, but it is a nice way to live, isn't it? Sue says, your designs are stunning in the way you uphold. Thank you so much, Suze. You know, it's important that we work as a community, right? Because if there's no point in putting other people down to put myself up. That's why the trouble that I've had this week has been so disheartening. But I, going to New York definitely helped me shake it all off. I know a lot of you caught that. Um, this necklace is from my Aunt Joan who passed away a few years ago. It's a jade necklace. She was a lady with many secrets, right? I'll, I'll write a book or a short story one of these days. Many naughty secrets. Crazy secrets, naughty secrets, all kinds of secrets. Um, but this is one of the necklaces that she had that my mom had um, that's all like this white kind of jade. I have no idea what this is or what it means. And it's got a beautiful red cord that goes through and connects all the pieces. But um, she said to my mom at one point, obviously while she was alive, um, you know, whatever you do, make sure that that necklace is safe in the future because it's worth a lot. Now, that could mean anything. It could mean it's worth as much as a, as a house, or it could mean that you got it at TJ Maxx, but it costs $19 instead of $14. You never knew with Aunt Joan, but I really love the necklace, and it's nice and neutral. It made me feel icy somehow, and I thought it would make me feel cooler for the show, but it's not really working. Thank you for noticing. Oh, dear. All right, let me see. Oh, you, there's a bunch of comments, I think, about Deanne Fitzpatrick. So let me see. So Julia says, I stumble, we're talking about Deanne Fitzpatrick. I stumbled on her hooked rugs last year. Don't know where, but that's what sent me into the rug hooking rabbit hole. Absolutely. Absolutely love it. And how she embraces using yarn and mixing with wool. Me too. I absolutely love it. I love everything. I love all kinds um, of hooking and all kinds of rug making. Um, but I love that combo. And I think for me, she really owns that look. And that's one of the reasons that I don't do a lot, um, if ever, with like landscapes and things like that, because I'm already aware that our first names are similar and that it has potential to be confusing. Um, so I try not to do subjects that I think would be close to what she does. Now, with Monet, that's going to be hard because Monet does landscape. So these will be the first set of landscapes I do at Ribbon Candy Hooking. Um, but I feel like almost with Barbara Streisand songs, when I was a cabaret singer, you would never touch her songs because she owns those songs, even though she didn't write them. Same thing with Deanne Fitzpatrick. Um, the sort of faceless women, the kind of like um, in fishing communities in Canada with their very distinct dresses and sometimes the kerchiefs over their heads, um, the boats uh, rolled up on the shore, the little cliff cottages. Um, I feel that she owns all of that stuff as she should because she does so much of that and that is her world. 
Um, so I like to see her cover. I like to see her covering that. That is her world. In my opinion, she owns it, and I love it. I love the look of all of her stuff. Um, thumbs up. Yes, don't forget thumbs up. Let me get back to our next slide. So this was the last of the Deanne Fitzpatrick's that I had to show. I'm moving on to the next artist. Um, I've got to zip along because I have some more beauties. Birds to the flowers. So let's move on to Nancy Adele. We talked about Nancy. Um, this is a beautiful photo of her uh, in one of our past episodes. And um, she, she is so she is so different. She is so, so different. Um, there was a lot to say, and I'm not going to do I'm not going to do all of it right now. But if you remember, I'm going to show you some images so you remember what her work looks like. Uh, this is from, I think, Wikipedia. No, this is from uh, artgallery.novascotia.ca for Canada backslash Nancy Adele, E-D-E-L-L. -L. This is a quote uh, from Cliff Island, and he says, When Adele arrived in Nova Scotia, hooked mats were an established part of the folk culture of the region, though one that had not been uh, turned to a purpose, turned to purposes of visual art. Of course, by 1980, when Adele first encountered hooked mats, the use of traditional domestic crafts in the so-called high arts was established. Joyce Wheeland, for instance, uh, had used quilting in her work since the mid-1960s. And in Great Britain, Kate Walker had used embroidery since the 1970s. With, her hooked art, with the hooked art of the early 80s, Adele joined these pioneers as someone central to the introduction of the so-called women's work, kind of a movement, right? To the conversation, uh, uh, to the conversation of contemporary art. So, in other words, she is one of these crossover artists, fine artists, who takes up um, fiber art at a time when it's beginning to have a renaissance, but it's not. It's still considered kind of traditional and passe. As uh, she's one of the artists that takes it up, her area is hooking, right? And she named some other artists who are. Uh, more into needlepoint, uh, different different uh, sort of disciplines within textiles, but she's hooking. Now, it also says um, the word kinky has been used to describe the actors that populate these works. Some are partially clad, hooded players who appear to be engaged in secret sexual rites, updated Greek mysteries, and carnivalesque trans uh, transgressions. So, speaking of Aunt Joan, uh-oh... Good thing she's not around to hear that because I would be in big trouble. Um, let me bring you back here. My screen shifted. Come on, Nancy. It's a beautiful photo of her. But let's look at some of her work. You'll remember. If you search the Ribbon Candy Hooking channel and, and type in Adele, E-D-E-L-L, -L, it will pull up the episode where I did a huge segment on Nancy Adele. This is not one of the images I used in that segment um, for no reason other than it didn't fit the conversation on that day. This is one of her earlier pieces where she, you can see, to me, this is not sexual. I mean, okay, I see boobs and I see a brassiere. Um, this is very, very whimsical. Uh, I see kind of like, almost like a plague doctor kind of a face, but probably it's just a bird. Carnivalesque, absolutely. Um, to me, this isn't kinky, but of course, everybody ha is allowed to, to put their own interpretation and um, kind of uh, layer of, of uh, meaning onto every piece. I love this piece. I love the carnival quality of the figures in this piece. I love the carnival merry-go-round quality of this border. It's a simple border, but it's very wavering. It's, um, it's not perfect at all. I like the looseness of it, the fun of it. And I really love the hit or miss background. I really love it. And not only, hey, Latonia, good to see you. I not only love the hit or miss, I love that it's diagonal. I mean, isn't that really something? It's, it's almost like weather. It's like, it's like creating a weather situation in the background of these strange characters. It brings up all kinds of questions. Juliet, I don't know if you have something for us here, um, but it could bring up a, a, any manner of thing. And for um, somebody, it might bring up, again, like sexual rights or whatever. Um, for me, it's just maybe dressing room, La Cage aux Faux kind of a reference or uh, something circusy or just for fun, just for funsies. Um, so this is one of Nancy Adele's. This is one of Nancy Adele's, similar with the wings, right? Uh, beautiful directional hooking. There's a bit of like what looks like Walderboro going on here, at least in the body. There looks like there's some height to some of the hooking. It is super lush. It's beautiful. She's done her thing again with uh, diagonal directional, uh, which is interesting because there's a lot of diagonal. There's a, there's a very solid grounding of horizontal uh, hooking in this piece, but there's a lot of uh, diagonals too. Interesting. And right in the center, red is such a strong color for a non-traditional a non piece. We're looking at this piece 
um, it, it doesn't have immediate literal meaning for me. It's an image that I recognize the person. I, I recognize the element of freedom uh, or flight, right? Um, I appreciate that it's a woman in a bikini. There's all kinds of personal freedom for me represented in the way that she's dressed and the way that she's flying. Um, it's cheerful. It's light, right? It's very light. She's flying. But, you know, it also has, it, it has a lot of whimsy and it feels like another storytelling piece to me. The wings are breaking the border. It has an illustration quality to it. Um, I really like this piece. I love the big fat clouds, right? This, it, they're very cheerful. These are not the ominous clouds of Heather Goodchild, right? This is very different, very different artists still in that top echelon of fine artists, right? I mean, she was like toppermost, poppermost, uh, Nancy Adele. So, you know, if we're looking, we're looking at hook drugs starting at Grenfell, but we're looking at hook drugs by people who have made an absolute career out of using rug hooking as a medium. They are not trying to do traditional rug hooking. They are not interested in primitive rug hooking. Maybe they are in their personal life, but in their work, they're interested in pushing the envelope uh, with imagery that is not at all associated historically uh, with rug hooking, right? Juliet says, these aren't really speaking to me. I'm not seeing the complexity. It seems straightforward. It is, it's a lot more straightforward. I could see this as being a greeting card easily, right? Somebody might see this and say, God, that reminds me of the day I jumped off the dock and I felt like that for five seconds, you know? Um, so it's different things for different people. Sometimes you see an image, it reminds me of the classic, I'm sure I've said this before, I read Mr. Rogers' biography and him being a minister himself tells this classic story about how he was sitting at a church one day, not his, someone else's, as a member of the congregation just visiting. And the minister who was speaking um, he felt didn't do a particularly good job and didn't say anything that was very moving or inspiring. And, and he said it was one of the only times in his life that he realized that he was judging someone else, which was something he tried hard not to do. But he said he looked at the woman who was sitting next to him and she was in tears. She had dissolved, completely unraveled in tears. And he said, that's just the way life is, isn't it? Sometimes whatever he said really got to her and meant something. But for him, it meant nothing. It was just like kind of a waste of time. And art works that, that same way as a spoken word does, doesn't it? Or a book. Uh, you never know. The person sitting next to you could say, wow, uh, that absolutely changed my life. Thank God I saw that. This is the day I needed to see it, right? I mean, life's just like that. Here's another one by Nancy Adele. We definitely looked at this one. This goes to her sort of storytelling, uh, very, very elaborate rugs. Uh, Juliet says, yes, on whimsy and well done. No, probably not a lot of hidden meaning there. More, more toward pop art, right? More toward imagery that's just like um, more in the vein of pop art. So um, yeah, if you think of the other art, we talk about Keith Haring a lot in the 1980s, just very strong graphic images. Yeah, very nice job with shadows. May <laughs> Alicia says, maybe how gravity changes. <laughs> LOL. Yeah, absolutely. See, all, all different interpretations. It's so much fun. Um, this is one of the ones that brought the conversation up last time we talked about Nancy Adele. Do you remember us talking very specifically about, as an artist, one of the things that she was very concerned with was stop motion? Because I'm just remembering this as we talk. Um, wasn't it wasn't the case that she had gone to school? She was from Europe. Uh, I can't remember what country, but she had gone to school for film. I want to say Scandinavia. It's kind of coming back somewhere in Scan one of the Scandinavian countries. Um, and she was going to be, she was going to work in cinema. And so one of the things that she was very interested in in her work was the, the idea of stop motion. In other words, when motion stops, when a scene stops, what happened just before and what is about to happen? That became a huge preoccupation with her in her work. So for me in this piece, this is, uh, there's a lot going on here. The framing looks at first glance to be very um, classical, but it's really not. There seems to be something very architectural on the right, like 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 fretwork with flames coming up on top, which almost looks like a candle to me. Um, this is obviously a religious scene, like some kind of a cloister maybe, and there are a bunch of young women who are maybe novices around, although there seems to be a man in the back, maybe not. Um, I can't tell what's going on there. For me, that's the stop motion. It's almost like you try to take a picture and you hope nobody's gonna photobomb it, and there's somebody photobombs at a car or a person or something. For me, that person is that. But knowing that she was so interested in what this being a, a, a split second 
and the thing that comes before and the thing that comes after being the real story that you're not seeing that you have to fabricate on your own knowing that 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 person in that back sort of alcove that makes more sense to me super exciting floor a super exciting image of a teacher with all these marks on her that for me first read is blood i thought well, there's something like very biblical happening here um but no it's paint and of course these women are painting it at least the one in the front is painting i can't tell what the one in the back is doing um but it's an interesting piece isn't it um, Nancy Adele. So we saw a bunch uh, on our full length show on Nancy. We saw a bunch of these images. This is another one of hers. We looked at of the operating, um, theater. I think it was called the operating theater or something like that. Uh, emphasis on the word theater. Now this one maybe does have more sort of, um, sexual type undertones, right? There is some kinky dressing happening in the borders. Um, there's also something maybe happening with the surgeon and the person on the table, um, who knows? And, and I think one of the clues that we're getting besides the border scene uh, is the sort of the water, the pit of water in the foreground, um, the, the, the lights inside the surgery that are more like theatrical lights than, um, you know, lights to do surgery under, and this super sketchy border, right, with these monsters, these absolute monster snakes. Um, Oh, you think the one in the front is rug hooking? Oh, Eileen, you know, I'm going to have to go back for that. I'm going to have to go back for that. Let me see. You know what? You might be right. You might be right. Her hand is really close. See, I'm seeing this super small. Her hand is really close to the um, piece that she's working on. It could be. I was taking as a clue the apron with paint on the woman who's interacting with her in the distance. But it doesn't have to be. It could be that she's sketching. Um, but she could be doing fiber art. Absolutely. It looks like a frame. Yeah, it does look like a frame. Hard to say. I'd have to look at that one really close up. It would be nice to get a good, a good read on that, to get that a little bit closer. But it absolutely could well be. I love that one. And I love this one, too. Kinky though it is. This one's a little bit out of focus. But, um, yeah, there's a lot going on here. This is very much in the style of Nancy Adele. A lot of storytelling and a lot of big storytelling, right? These... Um, scenes that are posing all kinds of uh, questions. There's a lot of detail. There's a lot of complexity. There's there's many stories within uh, one frame. And again, I think this relates back to her interest in her former career in um, <laughs> in in movie movie making, right? Because it is over the top theatrical. There's so much happening, but it doesn't look like anybody else's work, does it? And doesn't that make it just so interesting? You know, looking at Nancy Adele's work reminded me of another artist, another Canadian artist. Um, could be hooking without a frame, absolutely. Um, and that is Laura Kenny, who is, she is absolutely one of my favorite artists. Um, I never like to say my very favorite, because you know, you hear that out of my mouth a lot. But I was looking at her stuff and I was thinking, she's my favorite artist. I just love her so much. I just love her world. If you are you aware of the artist Edward Gorey, right? I, sometimes I talk about him. He passed away a few years ago, but he was from Cape Cod, and uh, he he did the cartoon that was the beginning of the mystery theater hosted by Diana Rigg, and uh, very sort of macabre, um, grotesque kind of imagery, very funny, all done in pen and ink. Um, a lot of her work with the crows and the sort of darkness, women in the dark dresses, feels like that to me. But it's much it's much it's much more humorous. Edward Gorey meant it to be funny too. To be fair. Um, but it's interesting. So Laura Kenny, um, this is a quote from Sarah Fillmore, who's the chief curator at the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia, because of course, Laura Kenny is a contemporary artist. She's doing stuff right now. She's probably hooking right now. Isn't that a nice thought? Um, rug hooker Laura Kenny brings fresh, funny, and timely images through her quirky hooked character, Judy. Kenny's view of the world is decidedly feminist and environmentalist taking to task the sex, the sexist mundanity, as in mundane, of contemporary life. Um, so this piece is called Funeral Procession. Um, we're gonna look at a bunch of Laura Kenny's pieces. I think these are astonishingly great. Her character, Judy, so I, I'm not sure if Judy is in this one, but Judy, when we see these kind of lone woman pieces, um, a woman who seems to be, you know, battling the idea of getting down to housework I think that's Judy so it's funny that she has a name for her and that it's a specific character this is more of a group vignette 
but I love these women on both sides carrying the lighthouse, right? Because there's, there's gray figures echoing on the other side, but just like with a funeral casket kind of cortege thing, there's two women on the opposite side too. So we're seeing five women carrying this lighthouse and a couple women in mourning with this oversized black bird. Um, absolutely beautiful piece. It is so graphic. It is so smart those little pencil legs and this one woman right against the weather odds um, with a red like galosh galoshes type boots on uh, the mourners are two redheads right it looks like a mother and daughter I mean it's a story it's comical it's sweet it's quaint it's got a ton of charm it's beautifully done and one of the things that I love about oh Aileen you love Edward Gorey too funny but definitely a little bit twisted you are right one of the things that I love about Laura Kenny is she is a very traditional hooker. So, for example, when you look into the background, this is a very color controlled hit or miss. She's just swirling it out with these blue, red, a little bit of yellow. She's mixing it up. But if you look at that background, that's very recognizable to us as hookers, right? That's very traditional background. But she's got this very modern story happening in the foreground, happening in silhouette. But she's using wider cuts, very traditional hooking tricks. And she's doing a lot with hit or miss color. And I absolutely love that because it, it's, it's my comfort zone. It's my favorite area of hooking um, you know stuff that has a sort of historic quality to it so this really really speaks to me Sue says spirals are often a symbol of what goes around comes around interesting and the symbol of the goddess interesting I think you're probably referring to I've got a look possibly those spirals or spirals on the pants that is a very sheer shirt both of these ladies are wearing very sheer shirts interesting See, I'm learning great things here. Spirals are often a symbol of what goes around, comes around. I really like that. I really like that. I really like this. So Laura Kenny, let's look at some of her. This must be Judy, right? And again, I just love, this is the whole feminist angle, right? There she is. That's my phone buzzing. Don't mind that. Um, laying on the ironing board, distinctly disrespecting the ironing board and, and um, consequently, the work that's meant to be done on it, right? It's just so funny, the thought of seeing that ironing board and instead of taking those clothes out of the basket, just using it as a lounger instead. It's quite funny. It's smart. Um, I really love it. It's called I'd Rather Be Reading Than Ironing. Um, 32 and a half by 18, number eight cut, wool and silk on burlap, designed and hooked by Laura Kenny of Truro, Nova Scotia, 2013. Um, and I also pulled up from that same site, uh, the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia is well known for its colorful and quirky folk artists. While there does not uh, seem to be a definitive, definitive agreement on what constitutes folk art, most people agree on a few common characteristics. Simple in design, lacking perspective, and created by an untrained artist. However, perhaps the most outstanding feature of folk art is, not its, ability, is its ability to elicit a smile. And I would, have to, I would have to go along with that. I think that's a great definition. Uh, Laura Kenny's rug hooking does just that. Her work is whimsical, cheerful, and humorous. From a woman taking a rooster for a walk to a woman hanging her husband out on the clothesline, it is hard not to chuckle when looking at her work. Okay, that is from an article in the September-October 2013 issue of... Uh, oh, not issue. Um, Ragged Life blog. Ragged Life blog. I have more on her in just a minute I want to get to. I might run a little bit over tonight on Canada Night. Let's look at some of Laura Kenny's others. I just want to see through. I have one other artist after this. Um, this is her herself. This is from a site called Consumed by Inc. I-N-K dot C-A for Canada. Laura Kenny with her work. Right. So you get a real feel stylistically what she does. A lot with lighthouses, a lot with buoys, a lot of traditional symbolism. It feels like Canada, doesn't it? I pulled this image off of the Ragged Life blog also. Absolutely love this image. Um, these are a bunch of women. I wonder if I could make it bigger. I didn't realize it was so small. There we go. A little bit. Uh, a bunch of women that are holding up, very simple composition, but holding up images of Maud Lewis paintings, right? The double yoked um, oxen, the white fluffy cat, the three cats on the left, my eyes aren't good enough to see the back two, but they're holding up Maude Lewis's. And this is, again, from Ragged Life Blog. Um, 
Let me, I'm going to fly through a bunch of others, and then I'll do our last artist. Um, a lot of hers have women who are dressed in the very same attire who are dancing, like doing ballet dancing. They seem to have their red shoes or boots, galoshes on again. Beautiful proscenium, right, the, the theatrical curtains, creating a natural frame for this. And again, using her distinctive black, white, red lighthouse colors with all of those blues that are mixed a little bit with gold and russet. Very distinctive color palette. It's all Laura Kenny. I like this one too. This, oh, I didn't, these are all from Ragged Blog. So if you're interested in looking at that, make sure you pull up Ragged Blog uh, on the computer. It's a blog spot. Um, another absolute, oh, you know what? I bet that's Maude Lewis's husband. Do you think so? I'm just, I'm just guessing. Um, it seems like it might be what's going on here, kind of in a police lineup, because of course we know now that he was violent. We won't go into that right now. That is a super hard subject. Uh, and I'm only guessing that it's him, but it certainly appears to be him. Um, beautiful directional hooking in this. Using, again, her, her classic colors. Can, it looks like a Canada flag and the beautiful gold, right? Very 1970s palette on this one. Uh, looking at herself in the mirror. It reminds me of a Norman Rockwell composition, but it's all Laura Kenny. Very shape-driven. It's nice seeing the reflection of her, but because the mirror is round, we don't get exactly the repeat reflection. We just get an oval crop of the reflection. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Perfect image. You'd rather be reading too, Aileen. <laughs> you know, I love this one. I'm sorry if this is crass, but I loved it. You, you don't often see images of women on the toilet, and normally I wouldn't like to, but this is such a stylized and elegant toilet, and I thought, you know, this really normalizes and humanizes women who are, have been trained through, you know, y centuries of civilization to be elegant and beautiful um, and dainty and female and feminine, but this really defies that stereotype in a huge way. I thought that was a really bold image. Um, this one I loved too, Stop Sugarcoating Maud's Life. So I'm seeing a lot in her latest work, references to Maud Lewis. Um, so this may be something that I want to investigate and do a full show on, because of course we talk a lot about Maud Lewis. Um, we've talked a lot about her situation, her life, uh, her marriage, um, a lot of different angles of it. And much of that is very sad. Um, yeah, very dark and very sad. So I absolutely love this. Maud Lewis is classic cat Fluffy. All of her cats were called Fluffy. Um, but this is such a f sort of, a uh, nice, effective, graphic, cartoony way of getting across a very serious message. And I loved this one too. This was just very different color palette for her. And that's why I wanted to include it in this, in this uh, live show. You know, she doesn't typically go to all of these colors. It still looks like Judy with the black dress and the red boots, but there's a lot of other colors going on. Very hit or miss background, but it looks like she's holding a lot of flowers. There's some kind of a flower arbor behind her and there's flowers on the ground. Um, and this, for me, is very different to see in Laura Kenny's work. So I really liked this. It stood out as being a bit of an anomaly, although this is quite like this, too. Uh, this piece is called How Maud Would Have Marked the Graves. So it's obviously a cemetery scene very much in the style of a Maud Lewis village uh, with flowers where the stones are, right, or on the stones. So absolutely so different, so beautiful, so interesting. Um, I'm going to come back to Laura Kenny and do a full show on her because I have a great interview with her in my hand. Um, I'm going to save it. I'm going to save it and I'm going to come back to her. Um, she is so good and she's worthy of a full show for sure. I'm going to move on to another artist uh, who I had not heard of before. This was a rabbit hole for me. Um, like I said, the framework for the show was that first article I shared with you, but all of these last artists, the last five, six, seven, have, were not on that list. I went down a bunch of rabbit holes, but that certainly gave me the skeleton for doing this, a starting point. This artist is called Delza Longman, um, and I got off of uh, narrativethreads.ca. It's a website, narrativethreads.ca. Delza Longman has been a longstanding member of the Crafts Guild of Manitoba and a prolific rug hooker. Her hooked pictures, such as this, this is the one that was shown when I pulled this off, um, such as this one, were a staple of the guild shop for many years. Crocuses and grain elevators were the most popular subjects. By 2006, she had completed an estimated 875 rugs, and she, is still rem and she still remembered some of the milestones. Her 500th piece, for example, was an image of a loon. Scenes from nature were her main inspiration. And she had a particular concern for endangered species of birds and plants. 
Uh, this lady's slipper. Oh, I'll show you the ladies. Oh, this is the lady slipper. This lady slipper, a beautiful but threatened wildflower, is an excellent example of her signature hooking style. Um, despite the fact that she hooked so many rugs, I only found two online. That made me very sad. Um, this is another beauty. I don't have a title for this. But I was amazed um, with 875 rugs that there are only two online, you know, because this is like the World Museum, isn't it? We can only see two at this moment. So if anybody knows anything more about Delza Longman, I would love to find out. You can see she's a very technical hooker, right? She's hooking in a very small, um, I can't tell if she's hooking, it looks like she's hooking with strips. Um, she, she's hooking in a very uniform manner. It's like a grid, isn't it? Um, it's very different. Her style is very different. It's very realistic. It, it looks a little bit like paint by numbers or needle points, right? Needle point embroideries. Very, very lovely, very different. And I researched her further. Um, I, I researched her further because she passed away um, in April of last year, 2021, at the age of 104. And I also found something that said Longman, I was reading her obituary page and stuff. I feel so ghoulish when I do that, but I was trying to find out as much as I could. Longman originally learned to hook from her mother, but she drew inspiration from the Grenfell mission style, bringing this episode full circle. Uh, after a friend asked her to repair a damaged rug, she created impressively detailed images with delicate shading and tonal variations by using particularly fine burlap backing cloth and thin strips of nylon. There we go, she's hooking with nylon. Rather than dyeing her own wool, as many rug hookers do, she used materials drawn exclusively from old nylons and tights, hunting through bargain basement sales in search of precisely the right shade was part of the fun for Longman, who worked on several pieces at once to avoid getting stuck on a missing color. She began using old stockings in place of wool in the late 1940s, uh, as many craft suppliers or supplies were in short supply during the Second World War. Um, that was all I found out about her. And then, I, again, I was looking at her obituary, but not, nothing on the obituary or the comments that people had left mentioned the rug hooking. Um, and I thought, man, that must have been a big part of her life. 875 rugs is a significant contribution to the craft. Um, but in any case, that's where that brought me. I knew it was going to bring me kind of to the end of the episode. Um, but I do want to return to Laura Kenny for sure, because she is a super important contemporary Canadian rug hooker. Um, and again, in this looks like a wedding dress. Um, oh, the uh, Maude Lewis took her uh, lemon and made lemonade. Absolutely. Karen says, just bought a couple of Maude Lewis's patterns and would love to learn more. Karen, I did a Designing Like Maude Lewis class left last year. It's still available as a recorded version. I am thinking about running that one again in the future, too, because that's one that people ask for a lot as a live class. I have done a lot of shows on her, too. So those are all in the hundreds of ribbon candy hooking videos that are now online. Um, but, you know, I, I went through this night um, not really getting a feel for how it would evolve, and I wanted it to be special for the Canadians, special for all of us, but I wanted, I wanted to make it special so that the Canadians would be proud. Um, and I left out a lot, as I would have to, because it's a huge, it's a huge country and there's been hundreds of thousands of rock hookers who've done significant work. Um, and I did not get to Ritamere, which we have talked about a lot lately, Chetty Camp, which I've also done some really good, very thorough shows on, and Lillian Burke herself um, in the Garrett Blue Nose Company. And we've, done, we've covered all these things many times. We will cover them again. They're new and different each time we talk about them with new friends. Um, but those were three subjects that I hope to get to tonight, and I just didn't. I went, as soon as I got away from, like, the beginning of the presentation, I went toward some contemporary rug hooking artists, and I thought, this is new terrain for us. So I tried to split the night into things that you would expect to hear tonight and hopefully give you some ideas of some new names that you could go down the rabbit hole with um, and see what you could find. So I hope that you enjoyed tonight. I certainly enjoyed being with you Um you are very welcome. I loved all of the art that we saw tonight, and there's a, there's a lot more to it. We cannot celebrate Canada in one night, that's for sure. So you know that there will be a lot of nice episodes coming up where we dip back into the honeypot of many of these artists' work. Um, but in the meantime, what is today? Today is Friday. Um, happy Canada Day to our friends in Canada. 
um, happy 4th on Monday. I will run a show on Monday. So I will be here with you celebrating the 4th of July. I will probably be putting together a show on patriotic imagery because that would make the most sense, wouldn't it? And I better get going with that. Um, I was looking for fireworks and stuff for the kids. There's not a lot going on here. I'm really surprised. There's very little going on. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if they even care. I like to see fireworks more than anybody, I guess. We could always light off some sp uh, sparklers in the backyard and hold those until they bur burn our hands, right? Um, in any case, happy long weekend for you in the United States, uh, going right through to the 4th of July. And, um, and I'll be with you on the 4th of July. And ha ha one last happy Canada Day for our friends in Canada. Please like, subscribe, comment, all of those things to help these videos be more visible. I'll be back in the studio with you on Monday. If you want me in the meantime, ribboncandyhooking at gmail.com. We have our next gallery night coming up on, um, I think it's our next Friday night, right? Um, so make sure, no, two Friday nights away. Make sure you're sending me images that I can include. Otherwise, I'm pulling them off the Facebook page. I want to see what you're working on now. Make sure you send me all your great images of things that you've done or things you're working on now or just starting to ribboncandyhooking at gmail.com. Um, no fireworks there. Oh, you are so welcome. What a, what a lot of beautiful work to pull from. I mean, this was easy for me to put together. Um, Time-wise, I was afraid I was going to run out of time because we were going to New York, but I didn't. It was so, it was, there was so much material that it was very, very easy. All of these talented Canadian artists, my word. Well, have a great weekend, hey, Kay. Have a great weekend, everybody. And if you need me, you know where to find me. Um, I'll be back with you on Monday for American Independence Day. Uh, in the meantime,